hit record. You guys should see something on your end. And we're going to jump back in, uh, just jump right back into our offer to purchase and contract. Actually, before we do that, I want to look at a couple of other things. Not, not yet. We're close. We mentioned a few forms in class last week. So I just want to make sure that we had a chance to discuss this. Um, the first one that we mentioned kind of in passing, this isn't a form they require us to go over, but I know we mentioned it in passing. So I think it's worth just bringing up here. This is the unrepresented seller disclosure and fee agreement. So this is the situation where your buyer is interested in a for sale by owner and the FISBO has agreed to pay your commission. So when you call that FISBO, when your buyer says, I got a FISBO, uh, I want to see uh, two o'clock this afternoon. And you call the FISBO and you say, hey, I got an interested buyer. Can we come by and see it? And the FISBO says yes. And you say, by the by, are you willing to pay my commission? And the FISBO says, sure, no problem. Are y'all going to take that FISBO at their word? Y'all going to believe them because they said, yeah, whatever? Please, please shake your head no. Guys, nobody's going to watch out after your commission like you. So how in that case you can protect your commission is by having the seller complete. Notice it says unrepresented seller. Am I trying to enter into an agency agreement with this seller? Am I trying in any way to create agency? No, first word says unrepresented. I'm acknowledging that the seller is unrepresented. I'm acknowledging that the seller has chose to go this route alone. So this is a seller disclosure and fee agreement. And um, I'll let you look here. It's form 150, standard form 150. So if you have that information. So you need to get this to the FISBO if they agree to pay your commission. In addition to this, whether or not they agree to pay your commission or not, what else do I need to provide that for sale by owner? Don't care if they're gonna pay me or not. What else do I need to get to them? Working with real estate agent disclosure. Absolutely. Doesn't that seller have the right to know that you represent the buyer in this transaction? Doesn't the seller have the right to know that you don't owe them confidentiality? That whatever they tell you, you have your duty to tell the buyer. So regardless if the seller is going to pay your commission, I don't care, it doesn't matter. We're always going to do our working with real estate agent disclosure. If they agree to pay your commission, we got this unrepresented seller disclosure and fee agreement. Questions on this one? Protect your money, y'all. We're going to leave that at that. Everybody promise me? Julie, I promise. Another form that we talked about last week that kind of gets us back into our offer to purchase and contract. This is, and again, if you're a numbers person, this is form 355T. I think sometimes having at least an idea of the numbers helps us sort through all these forms. If you guys tried to go through all the NCAR forms lately, there are a lot. So kind of having an idea helps us get there. Remember last week when we looked at our offer to purchase and contract, and we had that provision about what happens if the due diligence fee or the earnest money are late, or what happens if either one of those bounce. So the contract's pretty clear. It says the seller provides buyer written notice. And upon receipt of that notice, the buyer has one banking day to deliver readily available funds. Remember, once you get this notice or once your buyer gets this notice, personal check is no longer acceptable. Your first check bounced to me. Why am I gonna accept another check from you? You guys with me? So the commission, the contract does not specify how we give that written notice. Would an email from the seller to the buyer suffice as written notice? Would an email work? Sure, it's written notice and it doesn't say using the form. It just says buyer or seller has to provide buyer written notice. However, some of us are kind of nerds and we like things to look official. And if you're like me, we have a form that we can use. Would you guys rather use a form or an email? I don't know that either one is wrong and I can't answer that for you. Your BIC may weigh in on it, uh, but they provide us this form uh, to make things look nice and neat. So this is between the seller and the buyer. And paragraph one is straight from the offer to purchase and contract. All they've done is just taken that paragraph that we looked at 
in 2T and they divvied it up into three bullet points. So buyer agrees to deliver to seller due diligence or earnest money by due date specified in the contract. If buyer fails to deliver or should any check or other funds be dishonored, buyer shall have one banking day after written notice to deliver cash, official bank check, wire transfer, electronic transfer to the payee. In the event the buyer does not deliver readily available funds, seller shall have the right to terminate this contract upon written notice to the buyer. Seller shall have the right. Does that mean the seller has to terminate, that they're obligated to terminate? No, no. But in order for them to collect the due diligence and the earnest money, again, either they're late or they bounce, the seller may need to enact this provision of the offer to purchase and contract. Uh, then goes on to say buyers failed to deliver. What did they fail to deliver or the funds have been dishonored? Um, seller hereby, I, this is my favorite part. Seller hereby demands that buyer deliver cash, official bank check, wire transfer, et cetera, no later than one banking day. This is a form that only the seller has to sign. The buyer's not signing this because the seller is notifying the buyer all right, you've received your written notice. Now you got one banking day to bring me those readily available funds. This is the names of these forms. My goodness, notice to, bu to buyer to deliver cash, official bank check, wire transfer, or electronic transfer. Questions on that one? Do you have to have this form to pursue anything further if they don't perform? The contract just says the seller has to deliver a written notice to the buyer. Okay, but you do have to have written notice of some sort. You have to have written notice. Yep. Okay. And it's very it's, it's specific about that. Seller has to deliver written notice. I would consider an email written notice, but I'm not the judge. You know what I'm saying? It might depend on the judge's mood that day. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> Other questions on this one? comments okay so where are we we are in the throes of our offer to purchase and contract and where we were we were in the middle of provision four uh, guys remember what we said in standard form 2t provisions four five and six are all about the buyer so if you're working with the buyer, these are, you know, I would point these out to them. I would say, this is for you. These are your provisions. And we started talking about provisions four, which is the buyer's due diligence process, what they should do during the process. And we talked about getting the loan approval, um, buyer's investigation of the property, sale or lease of existing property. We're going to see a little bit more about this um, in a future page uh, on our contract. But right now what we're doing is just notifying the buyer. If you have to sell or lease another property in order to be able to purchase this one, please try to do so during due diligence or be reasonably sure doing, during due diligence that your other property will sell or lease. So now where we are in provision 4D, is repair improvement negotiations and agreements. Buyer acknowledges and understands the following. Unless the parties agree otherwise, here it is. The property is being sold in its current condition. That's how we say it's as is. Is the seller obligated to do any repairs? No, why? Because the property is being sold in its current condition. If the seller agrees to do one repair, then we need to do our due diligence request and agreement that we looked at last week. Basically what we're doing is amending this one sentence. Even if that repair is, I'm gonna change the light bulb on the front porch, we have amended this provision. And in order to have your seller or the seller contractually obligated to do any agreed upon repairs, we have to have that amendment. We have to have that due diligence request and agreement. Then it goes, let's see, I've not been paying attention to my chat, but it doesn't look like I missed anything. Okay, good. 
Then it goes on to say seller may, but is not required to engage in negotiations for repairs and improvements to the property. So it tells us that the seller can choose um, to do that, but they don't have to, they're under no obligation. Um, what do you guys tend to think when you see a property listed in MLS as, as is? What, do, what, what, do, what does that mean to you when it says as is specifically? Um, that they makes me think that I heard, yeah, I see. Hermanda, I'm sorry, what I had a couple going on here. Amanda, can you repeat? Oh, I, I just said that it makes me think that, you know, there probably will be repairs or it's not in, you know, tip top condition. Um, okay, so there's there's known repairs, but the seller saying, mm -mm, I'm not touching them. Right, and, yeah. And Aaron, what did you say? Oh, I was pretty much that where um, they won't be making any repairs. So there's no point in requesting. Yeah, and you know, buyers typically don't like this, right? Because, you, you know, please make sure we have conversations with our buyers so that they understand that the seller's not required to do any repairs, but we can still ask. Uh, when they do advertise as is, that kind of what it says to me is that the seller um, isn't willing to do any repairs. Does that mean the buyer's agent can't ask? Ah, we can always ask, guys. The worst they can do is what? Say no. The seller can't terminate because the buyer asked for repairs. So, you, you know, every situation is different. Every transaction is different. Um, I just, again, I caution you guys to go into the transaction when it says as is, you, you know, please don't go into this. Well, they're not willing to fix anything. Probably not. But to best represent your buyer, can it hurt to ask? I mean, kind of like the judge, right? You never know when you catch them on a bad, on a good day, let's say, and they're in a good mood and they say, yeah, all right. Um, there's no rule, no commission rule about asking. Most of the rules that we have come about how we respond. So I think as a buyer's agent, you know, again, have the conversation, explain to them this one very important sentence in our contract and let them know um, that the seller because the remarks say as is, the seller very well may not say anything, um, but maybe if the buyer's just really adamant about something, I mean, it can't hurt to try. And then our buyers know that we worked in their best interest, that we worked for them. It goes on to say, buyer is advised to make any repair improvement requests in sufficient time to allow negotiations to be concluded prior to the expiration of due diligence. Any agreement that the parties may reach with respect to these repairs is in addition to this contract and is writing and signed by the parties in accordance with paragraph 19. Um, that kind of goes with what we were saying last week. We have to have a pair repairs agreed on in writing and signed while we're still in due diligence. The repairs themselves don't have to be complete until prior to settlement. And we got a blue note here pointing us to paragraph 8C about accessing the property. Buyer's obligation to repair damage. Buyer shall at their expense promptly repair any damage to the property resulting from any activities um, the, of the buyers and agents and contractors, but buyers shall not be responsible for any damage caused by accepted practices either approved by the North Carolina Home Inspector Licensing Board or applicable to any other North Carolina licensed professional performing reasonable appraisals, tests, surveys, examinations, and inspections of the property. This repair obligation shall survive any termination of this contract. So if the buyer's home inspector damages the property, who's on the hook for it? Who gets to pay for that damage? The buyer. buyer. Is it important that we're recommending good home inspectors um, with the reputation that kind of know what they're doing? Now, we're all human. We all make mistakes. Can things still happen? Of course it can. Um, any damage either approved by um, the licensing board or other North Carolina licensed professional. The best example I have for this, and, and this one makes me laugh, every single time I see it on a home inspection report. 
Have you guys, have you seen a home inspection report yet where the home inspector is pointing out that there's rotting or soft wood around like the door frame or the windowsill? And you know what they do? They take their screwdriver and they jam it in there and then they take a picture of it. Guys, the home inspector didn't damage the property. The home inspector was showing that had this not been soft wood, my screwdriver wouldn't stick in this. Does that make sense? So I think that would be something. They didn't cause the damage. They were showing the damage. Uh, a lot of those home inspector reports, a big majority, a big bulk of it are pictures um, actually showing what the home inspector is talking about. So if he's trying to put it, point out soft wood or rotted wood, uh, that's how they're going to do that. I laugh every time I see it. Like, what's a screwdriver doing sticking out of the window sill? Uh, but they're making a point. The last piece of this, this repair obligation shall survive any termination of the contract. So the buyer has the home inspection done. The home inspector damages the property that's not part of the approval of the licensing board and the buyer terminates. The buyer's still on the hook to fix that. It's pretty clear here that it's at the buyer's expense to fix that damage, even if they terminate. So in other words, they can't get out of fixing that um, because they terminated. Comments on that? Uh, then we have a paragraph about indemnity. Buyer will indemnify and hold the seller harmless uh, from all loss, damages, claims, suits, et cetera, which shall arise out of any contract, agreement, or injury, um, or as a result of any activities of buyers, buyers, agents, and contractors relating to the loss, damage, et cetera, and or out of seller's negligence or willful acts or omission. Again, this indemnity shall survive this contract and any termination hereof. I think that's pretty standard boilerplate stuff. Um, we're gonna see something very similar when we look at the seller's provisions as well. Seller won't hold the buyer harmless. Buyer's right to terminate, provided that buyer has delivered any agreed upon due diligence fee. Buyer shall have the right to terminate this contract. Remember what we said, for any reason or no reason, all they have to do is deliver to the seller written notice of termination during the due diligence period, time being of the essence. If the buyer timely delivers the termination notice, this contract shall be terminated and the earnest money deposit shall be refunded to the buyer. So as we've been saying all along, the buyer terminates within due diligence. The seller's going to keep the due diligence fee. That's what the buyer paid for. The buyer paid for the right to terminate. But if the buyer terminates within due diligence, all they have to do is provide written notice. They don't even have to tell the seller why they're terminating. They just have to provide written notice that they are terminating. And when they do so, the earnest money deposit shall be refunded to the buyer. Last thing about the buyer's due diligence process, closing shall constitute acceptance of the property in its then existing condition unless provision is otherwise made in writing. We are going to see in just a minute, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the final walkthrough, but you guys notice how this provision is like all caps and bold, kind of like it's important, right? So what we're saying here that once the buyer signs at closing, Congratulations, buyer. This house and all its problems, or this property and all its problems, are now yours. Once they sign, they're agreeing to take it to the condition that it is currently in. So, if you don't do the final walkthrough, how do you know what your buyer signing off on? 
how does your buyer know what they're signing off on? It's so important. Even if I've had buyers be like, no, I'm good. I'm like, well, if you're not going to go, I'm still going to go anyway, because, you know, I'm going to see it. And if I'm going without my buyer, I'm going through and taking video too. So I have documentation to protect myself. Um, most buyers though, will want to do, in my experience, most buyers will want to do the final walkthrough. And we're doing that final walkthrough as close to settlement as we possibly can. Like if at all possible, we're swinging by the property on our way to the attorney's office. So we can actually see what its current condition is in. And guys, and this one hurts. I know this is rough. What if, what if, what if we do the final walkthrough and the buyer is not satisfied with the current condition what if it's trashed what if they didn't remove personal property what if what if what if your buyer pretty much has two choices they either go to settlement and sign or they don't if we're not going to go sign we need to make arrangements right like i would stand in the living room and call the listing agent and say y'all need to come get this trash or we're not coming to the attorney's office right i mean we need to try to make it's not over yet but my point is that your buyer needs to understand is they can't sign and then look at the seller and say, when are you going to go get that trash? Once they sign, they're agreeing to take the property in its then existing condition. So make sure, um, hopefully we've checked already any repairs. We've gone back and checked those that have been done. Um, this is one benefit of kind of seeing the property several times throughout the transaction. I had buyers a couple years ago and she was like, she's one of my closest girlfriends. And when we went, when we first saw the home, it was still vacant. They were or occupied, excuse me, they were living there. And they had the pool downstairs in the hallway for the attic. And we kind of poked our head up there and we saw a bunch of stuff up there. Um, fast forward, the home inspector went in and he noticed there was a bunch of stuff up there. We didn't see this home vacant until the morning of settlement. Like they moved out the day or two before, which is fine. That's fine. So absolutely, we're going to go do this final walkthrough. And just on a whim, my girlfriend pulled down the attic stairs and walked up there. And guess what? All that stuff that has been there since we saw it was still there. So I called the, I called the listing agent. I said, when are you guys going to get this stuff out of the attic? And she said, well, that's not theirs. Okay, well, it's somebody's and it needs to leave the property. If I can make a long story short, in the seven or eight years those sellers lived there, they never once looked in the attic. The stuff in the attic was from the previous owner. They had no clue that there was stuff in the attic. And I asked my girlfriend, because we went to breakfast, right? We went and got something to eat. And I asked my girlfriend, I'm like, you don't know what kind of treasures you may have got up there. Are you sure you don't want to? She's like, nope, I got my own junk. I don't want to deal with somebody else's junk. So the listing agent, the sellers had to go back to the house while we were sitting there enjoying our nice breakfast. Uh, they went back to the house to get that stuff out. I hate to say it, but they came in all like, you know, sweaty and out of breath and everything. How can you live in a home for seven years and never once? poke your head up in the attic and say, huh, I wonder what that is. Yeah, absolutely, Aaron, because acceptance of the property and its then existing condition, could the seller have come back? Yeah, but they didn't even know it was up there to do anything about it. So pretty much once you sign accepting it, that's it. Um, and we weren't gonna sign or she wasn't gonna sign. Is that not wild? Yeah, my buyers just found a giant jar of money um, in the what? house that they just bought in a master closet, uh, you know, on a shelf. And they asked me, you know, like, what do we do? And I said, I, I mean, it's you, yours, but, uh, you know, like, if you want to take the high road and tell them about it, I think that's up to you. But I just wanted to make sure I was right in saying that. Yeah, because once they sign, they're taking it. And okay. um, can, well, we don't know, like, how much are we talking here? I mean, it was a giant jar of quarters <laughs> and bills and all kinds of things. So, I mean, so, I don't so even run know. So, Coinstar and wow, isn't that something? Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, you know, and, and I appreciate, I appreciate you sharing that because they're like, oh my gosh, what do we do? Um, you, you know, I had sellers, they left, I learned a lesson here. Um, I was the listing agent and they accidentally left winter coats in the coat closet. 
And I did the walkthrough before the buyers did the walkthrough, but you know, the one place I didn't look was the coat closet in the, in the entryway. So I missed that. And after closing, my sellers called me and said, oh no, we need our coats. And I called the buyer's agent. She said, yeah, they were taking those to Goodwill. And I was like, well, dang, you just moved in. You know, I think a courtesy call in that scenario would have been nice, but just goes to show that you don't have to. Um, when we bought the house that I'm living in now, um, we had our walk through the evening before we closed. And the owners had already moved out of state and they had actually not packed anything in the house at all. So 20, less than 24 hours before closing, the entire house was still, all the closets were full, all the furniture was out, none of the furniture had been moved. The refrigerator was full of food. Oh my god! Like six months old food. Um, so we called the listing agent, like, yeah. she's like, well, their flight's been delayed. They can't get in. It's like, okay, but I was like, why haven't you packed anything? So they um, got in the night before closing, I would say like 13 hours before closing. Um, and they started packing, but they weren't done by the time we closed and went on record. So we went back over there and sat at the house until they were done getting everything <laughs> out of the house. Were you standing there tapping your foot patiently waiting on yep. them? To Kept reminding them, um, please get the expired gallon of milk out of the fridge. Please oh take out all of your gosh. trash. They tried to they tried to take some of our stuff that we had moved in. It was it was wild. I'll never work with that agent again. It was like one of the worst. I say, I mean, ever. Katie, let's face it. Let's be honest, guys. Buying a house is stressful enough. Yeah. anyway and then you got to stand there and tap your foot waiting on the former owners uh to get the rest of their stuff out that's that's crazy and yeah and we I weren't able to move in that night we had to go stay at a hotel oh my gosh yeah it was terrible i i think a really good point kind of what i heard is something i just alluded to listing agents when your seller moves out and they say all right we're done in the u-haul and we're halfway across the country listing agents why don't you go check it out before the buyer's agent does their final walkthrough so you don't get that phone call um just a suggestion of course but particularly guys if we've never seen this home vacant absolutely how long ago has it been since you bought i'm just curious uh this was may 2021 so it's still pretty, still pretty fresh. It's still pretty recent. Wow. That's crazy. Yeah. Other questions or comments about that last closing shall constitute acceptance of the property in its then existing condition. Provision five, again, is about the buyer, and these are buyer representations. These are things that the buyer is representing to the seller, and the seller should be able to rely on this information when deciding if they want to enter into a contract with this buyer. So this is information that the buyer is giving the seller. Uh, first up, funds to complete. Uh, we got two choices here. Check if applicable. Is your buyer going to buy this home with cash? Um, if so, verification of cash is or is not attached. Or is your buyer have to get a loan or other funds? So I think it's only fair that the buyer share with the seller how they're going to buy their home. If we're getting a loan, uh, we need a little bit in addition to the pre-approval or pre-qualification letter, we still need a little bit of information. Um, so what type of loan? Is it FHA, VA, uh, conventional USDA or other? Um, the amount of the loan. If we're getting a second loan, second mortgage, we have that information here. Uh, buyer intends to obtain funds from the following other sources in order to purchase the property. I know for a while, um, I, I've kind of been out of it uh, for the last year or so, but there used to be uh, quite a few, like for example, first time home buyer down payment programs, maybe offered through the county. Um, I'm sure there's still some out there. Um, that might be something that um, buyer tends to obtain funds from the following other sources where they're gonna get that um, 
first time down payment program for a sec, for example. Buyer's obligations under this contract are not conditioned upon obtaining a loan or other sources other than the buyer's own assets. Um, some loan programs providing funds for the purchase of the property selected by buyer may impose repair obligations and or conditions or costs upon the seller or buyer, more information may be needed. Material changes with respect to funding the purchase of the property that affect the terms of the contract or material facts that must be disclosed. So again, the buyer's representing to the seller how they're gonna come up with the money to purchase the property. The buyer also has to represent to the seller that they do or do not have to sell or lease another property in order to qualify for a loan or complete the purchase. Um, then we're instructed to complete the following only if the buyer does have to sell or lease other property. So if they do not, then we can move on. But if they do, um, what's your property address? What's the address of the property that you have to sell or you have to lease in order to qualify for this loan? Um, if applicable, check buyer's other property is under contract as of the date of this offer. A copy of the contract has either been previously provided to the seller or accompanies this offer. Buyer may mark out any confidential information such as the purchase price and the buyer's identity buyer to providing that seller. So everybody stand what, understand what's going on? I got this one person that's wearing two hats. They're acting as a buyer and a seller. So we want the proof that they are under contract, the home that they are selling, that they have a buyer under contract. And that's what we're asking for here. Failure to provide a copy shall not prevent this offer from becoming a contract. However, seller is strongly encouraged to obtain and review the contract on the buyer's property before accepting this offer. Does the seller have to? accept an offer if the buyer has another home to sell or lease before they can buy yours? No, when you get an offer, you have three choices, don't you? You can accept it, reject it, or counter it. So I'm gonna say in the last couple years, <laughs> when the seller has multiple offers in their hand, if one of them has to sell or lease, I I'm not thinking that's been favored as an offer unless money talks, of course. Um, I do think this is going to turn around. I think we're going to start seeing this more and more. The second check only if applicable buyers other property is not under contract. Um, and then we're told to check by it is listed and actively marketed. It will be listed and actively marketed or basically the buyers attempting to go for sale by own. So again, we're just representing to the seller what stage that home is in that we have to sell or lease uh, so that I can purchase yours. Again, our blue note says this contract is not conditioned upon the sale or lease of closing of the buyers of the property. If the parties agree to make this contract conditioned, um, an appropriate contingency addendum should be drafted by who? An attorney. Guys, we used to, this is important because a lot of old school agents out there may argue with you. We used to have a contingency addendum, but it retired. They did away with that form. Two years ago, four years ago, I can't keep up, but not too, 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 too long ago, they retired that form. So now we do not have a pre-printed form. So can the parties agree to this contingency? Can they? Sure, they can agree to anything they want. If they do, we got to get an attorney to draft up that contingency addendum. Comments on that, questions? Performance of buyer's financial obligations, to the best of the buyer's knowledge, there are no other circumstances or conditions existing that would prohibit buyer from performing the buyer's financial obligations. Um, so in other words, if your buyer was facing bankruptcy, for example, 
that may affect their financial obligations. That's something that we need to represent to the seller. The R codes, buyer has to represent to the seller if they've received it or not. So you can see here, we got some choices. Um, buyer has received a signed copy of the R codes prior to making this offer and acknowledges compliance with the North Carolina general statute. Buyer has not received a signed copy and shall have the right to terminate or withdraw this contract without penalty, which includes a refund of the due diligence, whichever the following occurs first, either the end of the third calendar day following receipt, the end of the third calendar day following the effective date, or settlement or occupancy has already happened. Here in the triad MLS, the majority of the time when you look at a listing in the attachments, you're going to see the RPODs or the MOG. Uh, the attachments, something here in the Triad MLS that we just stays between members of the MLS. So it doesn't go out to the third party sites. You're not going to find the RPODs in Zillow, for example. Um, so as long as the agent has access to MLS and they can usually see the RPODs and the MOG, assuming they've been uploaded. Um, every once in a while, there's a case, though, where the seller hasn't gotten to it. And again, it's happened in the last couple of years because things have just been moving so fast. But regardless of how rapid they've been going, that doesn't change the fact that we still have certain things that we have to do, like, for example, provide the RPOs in the mock. So listing agents work hard, sometimes harder than others, to get the seller to complete these. Remember, these are Seller disclosures, can I complete it for my seller? Can I? No, but what if they're stubborn and they're just digging their heels in and they won't do it? Can I just do it for them? It'd be so much easier. No, we got to let them do it. They have to disclose that property. So again, the buyer is just representing that they have or have not received it. And if they have not received it, then it kind of goes over their options of when they can terminate without penalty. We go through that same scenario with the mob. Uh, by the way, the third option here, there are some exceptions for the RPODs. There are some exceptions for the mob. So if it's exempt, then we're going to notify that as a third option here. I think the biggest exemption for the RPODs would be new construction. I think that's what we're gonna see most frequently. Um, if I could reword that, actually it's never before lived in dwelling. So I say new construction, but once somebody moves in, that exemption is gone. New construction is not exempt from the MOG. Interestingly enough, one of the biggest exemptions of the MOG is vacant land. I don't know why. I wish I had an answer to you. I wish I had an answer for me. Um, many schools of thought out there, but I haven't heard anything yet that I'm satisfied with. So at this point, what I know is that the MOG is exempt from vacant land. You'll notice we pointed out the guidelines to you last week. If you guys look at those guidelines to complete 2T, it actually gives you a list of exemptions for both. So if you're not sure if the RPOs is exempt or the MOG is exempt, you can always check out those guidelines. Questions on that? Just to confirm, uh, new construction is not exempt. From the RPOs. It is exempt from the RPOs. It is, not from the MOG, yes. Again, and don't let me confuse you. I say new construction, but really what they say is never before lived in dwelling. So that's why I tend to think, but can't you have new construction that's five years old and never had anybody lived in it? So it would still be exempt. I would wonder what's wrong with that new construction home if it's not been lived in in five years, but that's neither here nor there. Uh, I think we actually talked about this last week. Uh, buyer's receipt of the MOG does not modify or limit the obligations of the seller under this paragraph. 
and shall not constitute accept, assumption or approval by the buyer of any severance of mineral and oil or gas rights, except as may be assumed or specifically approved by buyer in writing. And then our blue note says the parties are advised to talk with an attorney prior to signing this contract if severance of mineral and or oil gas rights has occurred. So if you guys will visualize in your mind the MOG, there's three questions that the seller um, answers to the buyer. The seller says they've not been severed by the previous owner the seller can say yes, no, or no representation. And then it asks if the seller has severed or if the seller intends to sever. They cannot say no representation to their actions. So if the seller has severed or the seller intends to sever, their only options there, you guys, are yes or no. And as buyer's agents, if we see yes, that the seller has severed or they intend to sever, we're gonna have our buyer talk to talk to an attorney. It's to my understanding that those severances um, are deep legal, deep legalese, and they go well beyond our, our scope, our scale. And then provision six is the buyer's obligations. Um, we define special assessment back up in uh, provision one. Remember provision one was terms and definitions and it got us through like the first two and a half pages of this thing. And one thing we defined was special assessments. We said this could be a charge by the government or it could be the charge by an HOA to improve the property. So maybe the government decides to um, put up street lighting or maybe they decide to hook an entire neighborhood up to public sewer. They may impose a, a special assessment. Um, what if the HOA of the condo or the townhome decides to repave the parking lot or redo the roofs? That could also be a special assessment. So we've defined it back on page three. So now here we are talking about the buyer's obligations. Buyers shall take title to subject to all special assessments that may be approved following settlement. If there are pending special assessments, the seller should disclose those to the buyer. But if it's approved, if it's voted I after settlement, then that's on the buyer. Obviously the seller can only disclose what they know. Um, I think usually with HOAs, sometimes the members have the opportunity to go vote. I think if the government decides to do it, you don't get a choice. You just get a letter in your mail one day with a bill, right? So the seller should only disclose what they know um, but it's pretty clear that the buyer's responsible for them, anything that's approved following settlement. We will see the seller's obligations in just a second. Buyer's responsible for certain costs and you can see there a lot of this we've talked about, um, the loan, any charges by an owner's association, contract appraisal, title search, uh, fees charged by the closing attorney, recording the deed, and preparation and recording of all instruments required to secure the balance of the purchase price on paid at settlement. So it just lists out the certain costs that the buyer is responsible for. And then authorization to disclose. Buyer authorizes their lender, agent, closing attorney, everybody to provide copies of this contract to anybody that needs it to release and disclose buyers, closing disclosure, settlement statement, uh, whatever anybody needs to make this transaction happen. Remember last week, we walked through the scenario, buyer's agent, you got your buyer under contract and we did our little mini celebration, always celebrate the small wins. So yay, we got a contract. The very first thing as a buyer's agent you need to do is get that contract to the lender so they can start their thing. The second thing you should do is get it to the closing attorney so we can get closing scheduled. Why am I allowed to share their contract with third parties? Well, because the buyer gave us authorization to disclose. Again, we're gonna see something very similar when we look at the sellers as well. Any questions about the buyers, four, five, and six? By the way, I used to work with a lady, I always envied that she did this. 
but she always took a sample contract and she would color code it. So she might have like green for the buyers and no, she'd have like yellow for the buyers and blue for the sellers and green for anything that talked about money. And she went through and color coded it. And then she made copies of that to take to her listing appointment and her buyer consultation. Isn't that organized? Um, I always absolutely, but that gave her the opportunity to say, look, you're the buyer, so you care about everything that's yellow and green. You're the seller, so you care about everything that's blue and green. Now, I don't know what her success was in getting her buyers and sellers to read it any more than what, but I appreciate her effort. She absolutely made it easy for them um, if they did sit down and try to read it. So do with that what you will, um, but I think it was, a, it was a great practice that she did. So on that note, provisions seven and eight are all about the seller. So listing agents, um, these are the ones that we definitely want to make sure that we point out to them. We start with some seller representations. Again, this information needs to be filled out accurately. The buyer should be able to rely on this information when deciding if they want to enter into a contract with the seller. So first off, the seller is going to represent how long they've owned the property. They've owned it for at least one year, they've owned it for less than one year, or they do not yet own the property. Who's the seller that may own it for less than one year? On app, typically, I know anybody, but typically, who's the seller that may own it for less than one year? Investors. Investors, flippers, absolutely. Some lenders care about this. Some lenders want to know, uh, for example, FHA loan says that the, or used to say that the owner, the seller has to have owned the property for 90 days. So if they see this less than one year, they may have a little flag that goes up that um, wants them to ask some more questions, you know, to find out how long the seller owns. So who's the seller that doesn't own the property yet? I've only had one good example of this in my career. Has anybody had an example yet? the seller that does not yet own the property. I think you're on mute. An assignment. An assignment, that's a good one, absolutely. They're assigning the property to the buyer, yeah. I think the, the example I heard was a case where the builder was buying the land they were going to build the house and then they were going to turn around and said the whole thing is a package deal to the buyer. So the builder was still in process of buying the land. Uh, they hadn't owned it yet, but I guess everybody felt good enough about it to, uh, I would say that's a lesser used <laughs> provision, but an assignment is a really good example as well. Thank you. Seller's going to represent if the property was built prior to, what's that magic year? We don't have to memorize that year anymore, do we? The form gives it to us. 1978. If so, we're going to attach lead-based paint or lead-based paint and hazard disclosure addendum. An option. Yeah, Allison, that's good. So if you have an option on the prop. Ah, yes, thank you. So you have an option on the property. Maybe you're going to buy it. Maybe you're not. Um, Good examples, thank you guys. So lead-based paint. Again, you guys, paying attention to the contract when we have a need to use a form, it tells us, it takes the guesswork out of it for us. It makes it kind of easy, doesn't it? So do I need the lead-based paint? Well, if it was built prior to 1978. Owner's association and dues. Uh, seller authorizes and directs any owner's association, management company of the owner's association, insurance company and any attorney who has previously represented the seller to release to the buyer, buyer's agents, representative, attorney, lender, true and accurate copies of the following items affecting the property, including any amendments. So here is um, declaration, restrictive covenants, rules and regulations, bylaws, architectural guidelines, basically whatever the seller has about the owner's association, they're encouraged to turn that information over to the buyer. By the way, this exact same list shows up in the listing agreement. 
So can't we have this conversation with the seller when we're back in a day when we're listing the property? Look at your sellers and say, look, a good buyer's agent is going to ask for the owner's association documentation. So let's go ahead and try to get that ready because we know we're going to have to provide it. And then we're going to specify the, the owner's association. And we have a place for two. Some places have two. Some might have one, for example, that's mandatory and the other one is optional. So maybe the HOA is mandatory, but the pool is optional. But either way, we want to provide all the information. Um, the regular assessment and dues are X amount per, what is that, per month, per year, per quarter. Name, address, and phone number of the president, the owner association, or the association manager. And then the website. And again, we have a place for two. Fuel tank. Um, this was probably one of the bigger changes to our forum we went through in July of 2022. So if you had an opportunity to see a contract before July 22, I, I think fuel tanks were discussed at least three places in the contract. It was scattered around all over the place. And they made this big change, thank you forms committee, and they put everything we need to know about fuel tank in one place. So, I mean, that was huge. If you guys heard a woohoo last July, it was probably because of this. And now we don't have to hunt and peck for this information anymore. Uh, to the best of the seller's knowledge, there is or is not, pick one, a fuel tank located on the property. If yes, complete the following. So then we got a description. I got a place for two tanks. If you've got more than two tanks, then attach a piece of paper. Um, however many tanks you need to disclose. Um, it's currently in use or it's not in use. It's owned or it's leased. It's above ground or below ground. What kind of fuel is it? And who's the vendor? And then we go on. They kind of reworded this section to make it more clear. Um, tanks included in the sale. Buyer and seller agree that any tank described above that is owned by the seller shall be included in the sale as part of the purchase price, um, unless excluded in our fixtures paragraph above. And then the fuel. This is the one that has put people in court before after closing. Seller may use fuel in the tank described above through settlement, but may not otherwise remove the fuel or resell it. Any fuel remaining in the tank as a settlement shall be included in the sale as part of the purchase price free of liens. Seller's use of fuel in any fuel tank is subject to seller's obligation under this paragraph to provide working existing utilities. We'll see that in just a minute. There's been cases, you guys, where the seller has the tank filled and then come to find out they have to sell and they think they wanna make their money back or they think they're gonna drain it because they, you know, I just put $500 into it. What this is saying, this has eliminated all that. Whatever's in the tank when we close transfers from the seller to the buyer, no additional cost. If your seller wants to get upset about four or $500 for the fuel tank, just tack four or $500 onto the purchase price to let them know that they're getting their money back. I'm not kidding when I say this has wound people up in court, buyers and sellers, over the fuel. Um, everybody wants to make sure that they weren't getting ripped off or taken advantage of. So again, I think the forms committee, um, this was a much needed change to make that clear that whatever's in there, the seller's got to leave behind. First blue note, buyers shall be entitled to conduct inspections to confirm the existence, type, and ownership of any fuel tank located on the property. Buyers advised to consult with the owner of any leased fuel tank regarding the terms under which buyer may lease the tank and obtain fuel. And then this other blue note, state law provides that it's unlawful for any person other than the supplier or the owner of the fuel supply tank to disconnect, interrupt, or fill a supply tank with liquefied petroleum gas, propane, without the consent of the supplier. So this stops our seller from trying to siphon the contents of the fuel tank the day before settlement. Um, this isn't real estate law. This is like, you know, North Carolina state law. Questions or comments on that? Okay. 
Let's take a break. We'll come back in 10 and keep going.
Hi, Julie. I'm so sorry Hi. about that. You're here now. That's the uh, important thing. It's one of thing. those days. Um, remember, we're recording, so you can always go get back and, and caught up. Oh, yes. Wonderful. Thank you. And if you will please rename yourself with your yeah, sorry. Yep. Nope, you're good. All right. We are back. Any questions so far? Let me. Um, so seven was the buyer, I'm sorry, the seller representation. So eight is the seller obligations. Seller's biggest obligation, evidence of title payoff statement and non-foreign status. Um, well, I'll let you guys read this for time, but basically what it's saying is that the seller agrees to use their best effort to provide the attorney whatever they need so they can pass clear marketable title to the buyer. That's what this is all about. And that is the seller's biggest obligation um, is to be able to pass that. So as we said last week, if the attorney finds anything on the title, uh, if they find any uh, blemishes or kinks in the chain or whatever, um, then they will get with the seller to clear that up before settlement. This is why the buyer hires the attorney to make sure that they have that clear marketable title, um, authorization to disclose. We saw something very similar to this when the buyer's obligations. So whatever documentation us or the agents or the attorneys or whomever needs to provide so that we can make this transaction happen, the seller gives us that authorization to do so. Access to the property. A seller shall provide reasonable access to the property throughout the early year of closing or possession by buyer, including but not limited to allowing the buyer and their representatives an opportunity to conduct due diligence, verify the satisfactory completion of negotiated repairs, and conduct a final walkthrough inspection of the property. Seller's obligation includes providing existing utilities operating at seller's costs including any connections and dewinterizing. So just because we go under contract doesn't mean the seller can, can call the power company and have their power turned off or have the water cut off. They have a duty to provide those existing utilities um, operating at whose expense? At the sellers. So they're gonna keep those on. And, and guys, I, again, I think this is important. You know, now that we're under contract, the seller can't deny the buyer the ability to come on the property and do their due diligence. They can't deny the buyer to um, make sure any completed repairs are, satis are satisfactory completed. I know a lot of our home inspectors, for example, will go back out for like a mini inspection. Once we've done any repairs, they'll just go back and inspect those things that have been repaired. That's one option that the buyer may have. Um, they may want their guy to come out, their contractor, whatever, but they have that right to verify the satisfactory completion. And then as we talked about earlier, the buyer absolutely has the right to do that final walkthrough. How else do they know what they're signing? So absolutely encourage that. Our blue note says warning in paragraph four above for limitation on buyer's right to terminate as a result of buyer's continued investigation. Remember what we talked about after due diligence, the only thing the buyer loses after due diligence is their right to terminate. They can keep inspecting and investigating up until, there it is, up until the final walkthrough. So please understand just because due diligence is over doesn't mean they can't keep inspecting. Um, if we've had any negotiated repairs, they wanna check that out, final walkthrough. All they lose at the end of due diligence is their right to terminate.
Removal of seller's property. This goes back to what we were talking about earlier. Seller shall remove by the date possession is made available to buyer. All personal property, which is not part of the purchase and all garbage and debris from the property. So does the seller got to get the junk in the corner of the living room out? They should. Um, Katie, do they have to get the six month old milk out of the refrigerator? If the refrigerator is going to stay, they should. Um, so that paragraph covers the hat. Affidavit and indemnification agreement. Seller is going to furnish at settlement an affidavit and indemnification agreement in form satisfactory to the buyer and their title insurer. Um, executed by seller and any person or entity has performed or furnished labor services, materials, or rented equipment to the property within 120 days prior to the date of settlement and who may be entitled to claim a lien against the property as described in this general statute. Y'all remember the mechanics lien? So one form that the seller is going to sign at settlement is going to say, I, I promise you, this is an affidavit, I promise you, nobody can come back after the fact, bless you, and put a lien on the property. So let's talk this through. Seller agrees to do repairs. We're still in due diligence. We ask for repairs. And seller says, yeah, I'd be happy to do those. Where do I sign? We go to closing. Mechanics never paid. We go to closing. They put a lien on the property, not on the seller. So is it important that we try to see paid in full invoices, particularly with due diligence repairs? Um, and then again, seller signing something saying that this isn't gonna happen. Um, if it does, what if, I hear you, what if, what if, what if? If it does happen, this is why the new owner has title insurance. And if this mechanics lien does hit the title insurance company, they're gonna go after the seller first. You wanna know why? Because the seller signed something saying this wasn't gonna happen. They lied. So title insurance is gonna go after the seller first. If we can't find them or they're dead or they're broke or whatever, that's why, that's why the, the, the buyer uh, gets title insurance to protect them from errors of the past. Uh, designation of lien agent payoffs and satisfaction of liens. Seller shall have designated lien agent. Seller shall deliver to buyer as soon as reasonably possible. Copy the lien agent. All deeds of trust, deferred ad valorem taxes, liens, and other charges against the property not assumed by the buyer must be paid and satisfied by the seller prior to or at settlement. Again, this is something that the attorney will work with the seller with. The attorney does things in a very particular order. So once we all leave settlement and the attorney's doing closing, one thing they have to do is send in the funds to pay off the seller's um, liens, mortgages, whatever they owe. And then once that's done, then the attorney is going to record a um, lien satisfaction saying that the seller has, in fact, paid off the mortgage, outstanding taxes, et cetera. Once that's done, then they can record the buyer's new deed uh, and then the lender's deed of trust. But all that date and time stamp has to be done in a certain order. It tells a story. In other words, if you were to pull that information, you could see, in fact, that the seller did pay that off before they conveyed to the buyer. Uh, seller shall remain obligated to obtain any such canceling following closing. So if this thing makes it to closing with anything outstanding, the seller's still on the hook. They're still responsible. Whew. I would have a car conversation with the attorney if that's advised, if that's in the best interest of my buyer. I, I don't know. I want it all taken care of before I have my buyer sign. Um, but now we're sitting in front of an attorney so we can have these conversations. Good title legal access. Seller shall execute and deliver a general warranty deed for the property in recordable form no later than settlement, which shall convey fee simple, marketable, and assurable title without exception to mechanics liens and free from any other liens, encumbrances, or defects including those which would be revealed by a current and accurate survey of the property 
um, except this year's taxes, which we're told we're going to prorate. Utility easements and unviolated covenants conditions or restrictions that do not materially affect the value of the property. And such other liens, encumbrances, or defects as may be assumed or specifically approved by the buyer in writing. This property must have legal access to a public right of way. Two blue notes. Uh, first one says buyer's failure to conduct a survey or examine title of the property prior to the expiration of the due diligence does not relieve the seller their obligation to deliver good title under this paragraph. So in other words, if we find something after due diligence, the seller's not off the hook. They're still responsible for clearing that up. Second one is about a short sale. If it's a short sale, we're told to include the short sale addendum. We will talk briefly about short sales in just a bit. So hang on to that for a minute. Deed taxes and fees. Seller shall pay for the preparation of the deed. Who pays to have the deed prepared? The seller and all other documents necessary to perform the seller's obligations under this county. The seller shall pay for state and county excise tax and any deferred discounted or rollback taxes and local conveyance fees required by law. This deed is to be made too. Again, I need full legal names of all the buyers, anybody that's gonna be on the deed. And like we talked about the other day, you know, I think it's okay to, or it is okay to identify the relationship, um, particularly if it's not, what if you have a brother or sister buying a property, right? We want everybody to know that this is a brother and sister, thus they can't get it tenants by the entire. Please remember to you guys to stay in your lane. So when that brother or sister asks you how they should take title, do not whip out your pre-licensing book and begin to explain joint Tennessee and Tennessee in common to them. It's not our job. So when they say, you know, we're brother and sister, how should we take title? Get them to the closing attorney that they're paying for uh, to explain the differences and have them help them determine how to take title. Everybody good with that? I cannot advise people on how to legally take title. That's crossing the line. Agreement to pay buyer's expenses. Seller shall pay its settlement X amount toward any of the buyer's expenses associated with the purchase of the property at the discretion of the buyer and their lender, including any FHA, VA lender and inspection costs that buyer is not permitted to pay. Um, we're reminded to review the FHA, VA addendum prior to entering into this contract. We will look at the FHA, VA addendum in just a bit. Certain FHA, VA lender and inspection costs cannot be paid by buyer settlement and the amount of these should be included in the above blank. So for example, let's say this is a VA and we know that the seller is gonna have to pay the pest inspection, but the seller says, that's it, that's all I'm paying. At a minimum, you gotta put the amount of the pest inspection in there. Everybody with me? So if you put zero in here, now we, got a, now we got a conflict and we got a problem. So if there is something that the VA or the FHA may require the seller to pay, make sure you put that amount in. What if the seller agrees to pay $1,000? It's a VA and the seller agrees to pay $1,000. If you just put $1,000 in there, the pest inspection is gonna be deducted from that $1,000. If you want the seller to pay $1,000 plus the pest inspection, then you need to put that total amount. Does this make sense? So make sure we put in, you know, any agreed upon closing costs plus anything that the lender may require the seller to pay. I think what we've been seeing the last couple of years is a big fat zero. Sellers aren't paying ex closing costs. This is gonna come back. Um, it's gonna be a negotiated thing again. But remember we talked last week about not leaving a blank blank. So if the buyer and seller, if the seller's not gonna agree to pay any expenses, then we need to indicate that on here. So everybody's clear what the seller's expected to pay.
owners association fees and charges. Sellers shall pay any charges by an owner association or management company vendor as an agent of the association under paragraph 9A of this contract. Usually there's some kind of charge with transferring, especially with an HOA. Um, they got to do the, the administrative work for the new owner of the HOA. So there's usually some kind of charge. Seller's going to be responsible for those charges. Here is the third place that we talk about special assessments in our contract. Now we're going to talk about the seller's responsibilities for these special assessments. Seller shall pay. Are you guys here? Are you here? Okay. Did I pause on your end? No, I did on mine. Okay, good. <laughs> Seller shall pay in full at settlement all special assessments that are approved prior to settlement. So the seller is responsible for anything from the government or from the HOA that has been voted and agreed on, that has been approved. Does this make sense? Prior to settlement, it's the seller's responsibility. Whether payable in a lump sum or future installments. Uh, for example, the HOA of my condo, they redid our roofs oh, a year or so ago, and they were kind enough to allow us to pay in payments. I think we paid four payments over two years. So every six months we had a payment due. If I were to sell, would have sold my condo during that time, we've already approved the HOA. So I would still have to pay that amount in full and it would come out of my proceeds before I recorded, even though future installment payments, even though the payments weren't due yet. But because that had been voted, yes, that seller's responsible for it. Uh, provided that the amount can be reasonably determined or estimated, the payment of such estimated amount shall be the final payment between the parties. I've seen a couple times in MLS lately, and I'm not really sure how to interpret it. I'm not sure to see what you guys think about it, but I've seen an agent only, something like buyer to pay approved special assessments. Have you guys seen this? It, it, it kind of contradicts what this says, doesn't it? So are we gonna, not even kind of, it contradicts uh, what this says. So when you see that, I, I just hope a flag goes up for you. Um, that you can ask some questions, particularly as the buyer's agent, so you're protecting that buyer. I would think the written contract is going to rule over the agent only remarks in MLS, kind of back to that parole evidence rule that we were talking about. So if that's the case where the buyer is going to pay it, I, I think that this is something that would need to be addressed in writing, um, because what does the contract say? The contract says the seller. You guys, have you guys seen this? Do you have any thoughts on that? Okay, y'all make sure you read those agent only remarks. There's some good information in there sometimes and it's pretty important. Sometimes it just says call listing agent. Well, waste my time clicking on a link, you know, but sometimes, sometimes there's some good information in there. Late listing penalties, all property tax late penalties, if any, shall be paid by the seller. In other words, if they never pay 2021 taxes, the seller is solely responsible for those. Negotiated repairs or improvements shall be made in a good and workmanlike manner, and buyers shall have the right to verify same prior to settlement. I think we talked about this last week. That just makes me nervous. Um, Handyman specials, some people are better with a hammer than others. Um, when I send in my repair request, this is just me, but when I send in my repair request, I specifically say to be performed by a licensed contractor or um, a licensed electrician. I don't want anybody to have, think they have the power to go in and make those changes or those improvements. Home warranties, either no home warranties to be provided 
or the buyer may obtain a one-year home warranty at a cost not to exceed X amount, which includes sales tax and seller agrees to pay for it, or seller has already obtained one and will provide a one-year warranty from this company at a cost of X amount, which includes sales tax and will pay for it as settlement. Make sure we see this. Um, this is the voice of experience. I got to pay tax on a warranty. This was a mistake that I made. When you guys look at those brochures from your home warranty company, it gives you a cost, but guess what? <laughs> the cost doesn't include tax. So put in, a, put in a rough estimate. That was a mistake that I learned and I will never ever make again. Luckily sales tax isn't too, too much. So it didn't hurt, but it was enough to make me go, man, Julie, are you serious? Could you do that? So just make sure if they tell you the home warranty 650, for example, that's 650 plus tax. And keep in mind too, this says at a cost not to exceed. So if you put in, I'm just gonna make up a big number for example, if you put in a thousand dollars, that's a heck of a home warranty, isn't it? But if the home warranty is only 650 plus tax, that's all the sellers on the hook to pay. Cause it says not to exceed, the seller will pay anything up to that amount. Does that make sense? So if you're not sure the tax, just up it a little bit to make sure it's covered. No seller is going to sign this with $1,000, by the way. Well, not many sellers are going to sign this with $1,000. Home warranties typically have limitations and conditions. Refer specific questions to the home warranty company. Again, stay in our lane. And then sellers breach. Once again, we're directed to paragraph 23 below, which we really are getting to. Charges by an owner's association. This was another big change to our form in July of 2022. It actually um, spelled out nice bullet points who's responsible for what. So sellers shall pay fees incurred by the seller in completing the R codes. Fees required for confirming seller's account payment information on the owner's association dues. Fees charged for transferring or updating ownership records of the association. Fees other than those fees specifically required to be paid by buyer under this paragraph below. And then we get nice neat bullet points for the buyer as well. Um, buyer shall pay charges for providing information required by buyer's lender, charges for working, working capital contribution, membership fees, move-in fees, and charges for determining restrictive covenant compliance. I think the changes made to the forms in July this year were, were really good. They helped clarify some things. I feel like some of these were just commonly asked questions or um, continuing issues. So I do think the forms committee did a, did a nice job of trying to simplify this for us. This is what made us go from 15 pages last year to 16 pages this year. So, you know, good and the bad, right? You get a lot, lot larger contract. Prorations and adjustments, unless otherwise agreed, the following items shall be prorated with the seller responsible for the prorated amount through the day of settlement, seller entitled to the amount of prorated rents through the day of settlement, and either adjusted between the parties or paid at settlement. Here are the things that we're going to prorate. This year's real property taxes. Uh, any taxes on personal property. If the car is going to convey with an outside bill of sale, then we need to prorate the taxes on the car this year. Rent, if any, and owner's association dues, if any. Condition of the property. If the property is not in substantially the same or better condition at closing as on the date of this offer, reasonable wear and tear expected, buyer may terminate this contract by written notice delivered to seller and the due diligence fee and the earnest money shall be refunded to the buyer. If the buyer is not in such condition and buyer does not elect to terminate, Buyer shall be entitled to receive, in addition to the property, 
the proceeds of any insurance claim filed by the seller on account of any damage or destruction of property. Isn't that something? This one always makes me stop and pause. So we're under contract and the house burns down. Guess what, guys? It's not over yet. The house burns down, the buyer has a choice. They can either terminate with their due diligence and earnest money back, or they continue to purchase the property, get the deed, get the title, and also any proceeds of the insurance claim filed by the seller. What do we think about that? It can take a really long time for insurance claims to go through like that. Agree. Insurance companies aren't known for their rapid payout, are they? Right? I, I think, Katie, to your point, if I were the buyer's agent and my buyer looked at me and said, what should I do? I, I would tell them to do two things. I would tell them to, of course, talk to their attorney, but I would also encourage them to talk to the seller's insurance company. Uh, try to get that, you know, between them. Like, I know they can't give you exact time frames or everything, um, but help you have the seller help kind of review that policy, uh, make sure that this allowed that this could happen if that's the choice that the seller, I'm sorry, that the buyer made. I gotta say, if the house burns down and the seller still wants the property and the insurance, they really, really like the location. I think that's what it would have to come down to, right? It's, I mean, maybe it was just like the market we just got out of and they, there wasn't much to choose from. So even though the house burned down, they didn't wanna go back out there in the rat race uh, and try to be under contract with multiple offers. Any other thoughts on that? By the way, this was updated in July too. It used to just say earnest money. And everybody said, what about due diligence? And of course, guys, the answer is always, what does the contract say? So prior to July, the contract just said earnest money, which means that the buyer terminates, the due diligence stays with the seller, right? Once again, forms committee, thank you for clarifying that. And now it spells out that we have both. If they terminate, they're going to get both due diligence and earnest money back. Risk of loss or damage by fire or other casualty prior to closing shall be upon the seller. Sellers advise not to cancel existing insurance on the property until after confirming recordation of the deed. It is still the seller's property. They need to keep it insured. Um, they need to make sure that they keep that. Have you guys had a seller once? As soon as we go under contract, they're like, sweet, I can cancel homeowner's insurance. I had that happen. I'm like, no, it's still your. I understand somebody's contractually obligated to buy it, but guess what? It's still yours. So you need to keep that insurance through the day of settlement. We got two policies going on, insurance policy going on on closing day, don't we? We got the seller's policy ending and the buyer's policy starting. So what if the house burns down on closing day? Talk about emotional roller coaster. I, I think it would come down to the time that the deed was recorded. When did the house burn down and when did the deed get recorded um, to tell us who is going to be responsible for that? Again, the insurance companies still have to weigh in on that, but. Here's our delay in settlement. We now, within the last couple of years, have a seven day delay. Um, this paragraph shall apply if one party is ready, willing, and able to complete settlement on settlement date, but it's not possible for the other party to complete settlement by the settlement date. So we got the delaying party and the non-delaying party. The delaying party shall be entitled to delay in settlement and shall give as much notice as possible to the non-delaying party and closing attorney. If the delaying party fails to complete settlement and closing within seven days of the settlement date, 
then the delaying party shall be in breach and the non-delaying may terminate this contract and shall be entitled to enforce any remedies available to such party under this contract for breach. So for whatever reason, I mean, let's be honest. I think one of the bigger reasons why we have a delay in settlement is because we're still waiting on final loan approval from the lender. I'm not saying that's the only reason we can delay, but I think that's one of the more common. We don't have final loan approval yet. In that case, the buyer would be the delaying party, the seller, the non-delaying party. And the seller's only option in that scenario is to pretty much sit still, sit on their hands and be patient for seven days. They've got to allow that buyer seven days um, to try to get that loan approval. We could agree on a new settlement date. Remember last week we looked at our agreement to amend. If we agree on a new settlement date, we have another seven day delay, unless we check that little box in the agreement to amend, and now we only have a four day delay. So the parties could always renegotiate that settlement date um, if we don't, if we don't close on day eight, then the delaying party can choose to terminate. But they can't terminate within the seven day delay without themselves facing the consequences of breach. possession, including all means of access to the property, such as key codes, security codes, garage door openers, electronic devices, et cetera, shall be delivered upon when? Closing, as defined in paragraph one above. Tell your buyers they're not gonna get a key. They shouldn't get a key when they're at the attorney's office. Tell your buyers the key should come later. Do we all have stories about this happening differently? Of course we do. What does the contract say? Contract says possession should happen at closing. Guys, remember, it's still the sellers. Could you imagine the horror if the buyer got the key and started moving in and maybe the deed didn't record where the internet goes down and the deed didn't record or worse yet, the buyer gets hurt and it's still the seller's property so don't give that key out until it's closed. Doesn't the buyer have equitable title though during that time? So they have title not, insurance on government? Not until that deed is recorded. Actually recorded. Yep. Yep. That's the last thing. That deed on record. Then and only then is it theirs. I've had so many buyers at closing, like stand there with their hand out. I'm like, look, I want to get paid too. But guess what? Nobody's getting anything until this deed is recorded. Comments on that? I think it's about setting the, setting the expectation. Let your buyer know. You know, we go to closing at two. We should be on record by four. I'll get you the key. You know, try to give them a. Um, we may have a situation where we do a buyer possession before closing or a seller possession after closing. So the parties may agree to let somebody move in that doesn't own the property. Buyer possession before closing means the seller allows them to live there. Seller possession after closing means the seller is going to stay. We got forms for both of those scenarios. We're going to look at one of them. I'm not going to look at both because they're pretty much the same. Um, but the big thing about these is somebody's acting as the tenant and somebody else is acting as the landlord. And the big, big thing about these is making sure everybody's properly insured. So whomever the landlord is, is gonna have homeowner's insurance. Whomever the renter is, is gonna have tenants or renter's insurance. Our note just uh, prompts us to include the additional provisions addendum, um, which we will look at and the vacation rental agreement, which we'll talk about if need be. Okay, so we've gone through this whole contract. And like we said, when a need arises to use an agenda, it points it out to us. It puts it in parentheses and it says, use this. Then we have this nice little handy dandy checklist at the end. That's how I use it. I use it as a checklist and I go through it to make sure I got all the applicable agenda. 
So the more commonly used addenda, most of these, not all of them, but most of them we're gonna look at. And then we have a place for any attorney or party drafted addenda. And then we have a blue note, all caps, as a reminder for all, under North Carolina law, real estate brokers are not permitted to draft addenda to this contract. Only the parties and the attorneys. We talked about an assignment last week. So our contract addresses that. Contract may not be assigned without the written consent of all parties, except in a connection of a tax deferred exchange. Um, but if assigned, the contract shall be binding on the assignee, their heirs and accessors. So can this contract be assigned? As long as we have written consent of all parties. And yes, we have an attorney involved to do this. Tax deferred exchange. Um, tax, first off, a tax deferred exchange is a, is a good program for investors. And what it does is it allows the investor to use the proceeds of the sale of this investment property to purchase another investment property and they can defer paying capital gains taxes on the investment property they sold. So as long as they're using the money they made from this investment property and they take that money and they run out and buy another investment property, they don't have to pay capital gains taxes. Isn't that nice? And there's no end to this. They can keep selling and buying, selling and buying and defer and paying those taxes until they're done being investors. Great program. Um, what is it? The 10... 99 is that what it is 1039 it's an irs form it's got a number um but the tax deferred exchange if you are an investor or if your buyer's an investor you may want to consider having them talk to their accountant to making sure that they're taking advantage so this addresses that um, in the event buyer or seller desires to affect a tax deferred exchange in connection with the conveyance they agree to cooperate in effecting such exchange, provided, however, that the exchanging party shall be responsible for all additional costs associated with the exchange, and provided further that a non-exchanging party shall not assume any additional liability with respect to the exchange. Thank you, Karen. 1031, I knew one of you knew. So the 1031 is the tax deferred exchange. Uh, buyer and seller shall execute such additional documents, including assignment of this contract and connection at no cost to the non-exchanging party. It shall be required to give effect to the provision. I mean, there's a lot more rules than we just went over, which is why we want an account involved. I know, for example, that they have to buy something within a certain amount of time. I want to say six months, but don't hold me to that. Maybe 90 days. I don't know. But there's like a certain amount of time that they have to. Is it 90 days? To, to buy it's they've got 90 days to identify the property and okay. six months to uh close on it so i was kind of right on both places so so, <laughs> so 90 days to identify and then six months to close on it again you guys not our job to explain see how knowledgeable i am on it i know just enough to be dangerous so i'm telling my investor buyer uh to talk to their accountant The parties to the contract. This contract shall be binding upon and shall in order to the benefit of both buyer and seller and their respective heirs, successors, or assigns. When do heirs kick in? After the individual passes away. Death is only an out when we're negotiating the offer. Once we are under contract, death is not an out. Uh, survival, any provision contained by its nature and effect is required to be observed, kept, or performed after closing. It shall survive closing. We saw a few incidences of that uh, in the contract. Also, the parties agree to do anything after closing. Again, by this point, we're, we're more than likely sitting in front of an attorney 
So if the parties agree to anything after settlement or after closing, we can have the attorney draft something up for us. The entire agreement, this contract contains the entire agreement of the parties and there are no representatives, inducements and other provisions other than those expressed here. All changes, additions or deletions must be in writing and signed by all parties. Nothing contained here shall alter an agreement between a realtor or a broker and buyer or seller as contained in any listing agreement, buyer agency agreement or any other agency agreement between them. Um, so the contract is interpreted as a whole. The contract with all its addenda are interpreted as a whole. We're not gonna piecemeal it and pull out certain points of it. Conduct of the transaction. Uh, the parties agree that any action between them relating to the transaction contemplated by this contract may be conducted by electronic means. So we talked about the UETA last week and we had to have permission to use electronic means. That was a terrible line. Let's try that again, electronic means. Including the signing of this contract by one or more of them and any notice or communication given in connection with this contract. Any written notice or communication um, is gonna be set forth in the notice information section below. We're getting there. Any notice or communication to be given to a party and any fee deposit or other payment to be delivered to a party may be given to the party or to the party's agents. Delivery of any notice to the party via means of electronic transmission shall be deemed complete at such time the sender performs the final act to send transmission in a form capable of being processed by the receiving party systems, any electronic address provided for the party and the notice information below, which we're getting there. Buyer and seller agree that the notice information, the acknowledgement of receipts uh, do not constitute a material part of this contract and that the addition or modification of any information therein shall not constitute a rejection of an offer or creation of a counter offer. We'll talk a little bit more about that when we get there. Execution, this contract may be signed in multiple originals or counterparts, all of which together constitute one and the same. Computation of days, unless otherwise provided for purposes of this contract. The term day shall mean consecutive calendar days that does include Saturdays, Sundays, and holidays. Um, for the purposes of calculating days, we're gonna begin on the following day. Um, upon which any act or notice is provided the contract required to be performed. So we talked about the lender delivering, for example, the closing disclosure to the buyer three days prior to settlement, that excluded Sundays and national holidays. But when you're talking about a contract day, a day is a day is a day. Sunday counts, Christmas counts, every single day counts when you're talking about a contract day. Any reference to a date or time of day shall refer to the day or time in the state of North Carolina. This was an addition, I'm just gonna say within the last eight, 10 years, something like that, because there was an incident where a guy out in California signed it and he thought he was signing it on his time and it turned into this huge thing. Clearly we were close to the end of, I'm guessing like due diligence or something like that. And the date or the time, I should say, was questioned. So they came back and added this last provision. The times on the contract, the dates and times of the contract are where the property is located. So anything relating to this transaction, uh, we're going to use Eastern Standard Time. California, just um, when they sign it, it would be signed in Eastern Time. And then we have this paragraph 23 that we've been building up to the entire contract. I mean, how many times is paragraph 23 addressed in the contract? Again, this is fairly new. It wasn't July 2022. Maybe it was July 2021. It's fairly new. All of this was always in the contract. They didn't add anything, but they took the remedies and they gave it its own little section so it was easier to find. The only thing I wish, and this is just me, I wish they didn't slap it down here in the end when nobody looks at this last stuff anyway. 
I fear it gets, you know, kind of kind of stuffed in there. I wish they would have put it somewhere else. Um, but here we are. Maybe they will one day. So we got the remedies spells out breach of the buyer, breach of the seller, um, breach by the buyer. In the event of a material breach of this contract by the buyer, sellers shall be entitled to earnest money deposit, uh, the payment of the earnest money, and the due diligence fee to the seller without regards to their amount, together serves as the seller's liquidated damages. We talked about liquidated damages last week. Those are money damages that we agree to at contract formation. Aren't the due diligence and earnest money negotiable amounts? So we agree going into this. If the buyer breaches, which means they're terminating after due diligence, this is what the seller gets, due diligence and earnest money. Again, listing agents know that the seller's heyday is behind us. So we're gonna start seeing those amounts come down and listing agents, you're gonna get an offer one day for like $100 due diligence and $50 earnest money. Have a conversation with your seller because what they need to understand is that this is all they're entitled to and is their sole and exclusive remedy for such breach. That's it. That's all they get. So listing agents, we need to make sure that we have those conversations. Uh, it's acknowledged by the parties that the amount of liquidated damage is compensatory, not putative. Such amount being a reasonable estimation of the actual loss a seller would incur as a breach of the contract by the buyer. The payment to the seller of liquidated damages shall not constitute a penalty or forfeiture, but actual compensation to seller's anticipated loss. Both parties acknowledge in the difficulty of determining seller's actual damage for such breach. So again, our liquidated damages we agreed to at the time of contract formation. Um, I think one of the bigger questions I get with this is what happens if the buyer breaches, the buyer terminates, and the seller has already done all the repairs? You know, the seller's stance is I probably wouldn't have done those repairs if the buyer didn't ask, but they asked and I was in a good mood, so I decided to do it for them. The counter to that, okay, so the buyer breached, um, not a good day, we all get it. But now the seller can put their home on the market and advertise, this has been fixed, this has been addressed, I fixed this. So in other words, the stance here is that the seller is putting a better property on the market. I don't know if that's gonna help the seller feel any better. They're not gonna be able to recoup those funds though. All they get, sole and exclusive remedy is the earnest money and the due diligence. Questions on that? Breach by the seller. In the event of a material breach of this contract by the seller, buyer may elect to terminate this contract as a result and shall be entitled to return of both earnest money and due diligence together with the reasonable costs actually incurred by the buyer in connection with the due diligence costs or elect not to terminate and instead treat this contract as remaining in full force and effect and seek the remedy of specific performance. Again, seller breaches for whatever reason. They decide they're not going to sell. Maybe they can't sell. Maybe they can't come up with clear title. Maybe that long lost uncle uh, won't show up to sign the deed. If the seller breaches for any reason, again, the buyer has a choice. You can either terminate, get your earnest money and due diligence. You could go after the seller in court for due diligence costs um, if they're not willing to just sit down and write a check or you can seek specific performance. If you're seeking specific performance, the judge can make the seller perform. Breach for, let's see, breach by seller, if the seller breaches. 
the remedies for seller breach are much harsher than the remedies for buyer breach. Yes? I mean, buyer breach is all the seller gets is earnest money and due diligence. The seller breach is earnest money, due diligence, due diligence costs, or just sue them and make them sell. The buyers have choices here. And guys, the reason being for that, the seller's the one that initiated this whole thing to begin with by putting a for sale sign in the yard. If the seller never did that, we'd never be here for the seller to change their mind or not be able to sell. Does this make sense? So definitely much harsher. They're the ones that invited the buyer to make an offer to begin with. So let's take our break. We come back, we're gonna finish this up.
questions about our remedies for breach with either party? The last piece of this uh, discusses attorney's fees. It says, if legal proceedings are brought by buyer or seller against the other to collect earnest money deposit, due diligence fee, or due diligence costs, the parties agree that a party shall be entitled to recover reasonable attorney's fees to the extent permitted under this North Carolina general statute. The parties acknowledge and agree that the terms of this contract with respect to the entitlement of the earnest money due diligence or due diligence costs constitute an evidence of indebtedness pursuant to this general statute. The note says a party seeking recovery for attorney's fees under the general statute must first give written notice to the other party that they have five days from the mailing of the notice to pay the outstanding amount without the attorney's fees. So as I understand this, the party that's doing the suing can also collect in addition to whatever they're gonna be entitled to as spelled out the contract they could also collect their attorney's fees as well. Guys, let's face it, nobody likes to terminate. Um, termination notices are not pleasant. Nobody likes to be in the situation. Um, if your party is the one that um, would suffer the consequences of the other party's breach, they're probably not gonna be happy, might dig their heels in a little bit. Um, you know, At this point, it's pretty much out of our control you know, the contract says who's responsible for what, what do you expect to get if you breach, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but that does, still doesn't mean I can make anybody sit down and write a check. So if the seller breaches and they're not willing to just, you know, write a check, then the buyer's, you know, the buyer's options are to take them to court, but they might be able to recover those attorney's fees as well in addition to, to the, the consequences of the seller's breach. So those are our remedies. This always makes me giggle. The North Carolina Association of Realtors and the North Carolina Bar Association, remember the parties that created this contract, the people that created this contract, make no representation as to the legal validity or adequacy of any provision of this form in any specific transaction. This is important. If you do not understand this form, or feel that it does not provide for your legal needs, you should consult with a North Carolina real estate attorney before you sign it. We may have a situation, it may be a very unique transaction that the contract doesn't apply. Um, don't try to make it work. This is for basic, um, traditional, we'll call them transactions. Uh, at the end of the day, we may have to get attorney involved anyway. But don't tell them to sign now, we'll figure it out later. That's not the way legally binding contracts work. This offer shall become a binding contract on the effective date. We define the effective date back on page two. Unless specifically provided otherwise, buyer's failure to timely deliver any fee, deposit, or other payment provided for herein shall not prevent this offer from becoming a binding contract provided that any such fail failure shall give seller certain rights to terminate the contract as described herein or is otherwise permitted by law. And then we have a place for everybody to sign, buyer on the left, seller on the right. If it's an entity buyer or an entity seller, there's one person in the corporation or LLC that has been authorized to sign on behalf of the corporation and the LLC. That provision we saw a couple pages ago, uh, talking about the notice information and the acknowledgement of receipts. What that was saying is that this is the official end of the contract. So anything from here up is the legally binding contract. Signatures up. Sign of the times. We got to talk about wire fraud. 
wire fraud got really big, really fast in real estate. Think about the amounts of monies uh, being wire transferred back and forth to and from attorney's offices. You have a notice, wire fraud notice to the buyer. We have a wire fraud warning, I should say, to the seller. Um, we saw a wire fraud warning to the seller in our listing agreement. We saw a wire fraud notice to our buyer in the buyer's agency agreement. So this is the second time that they've seen this. Uh, I'll let you guys read this, but basically bottom line, what it's saying is the best thing we can do to help protect our clients from wire fraud. I want you guys to look them in the eyeball and tell them that you will never email them wire transfer instructions. And if they do, and then, you know, follow up, follow with your word. But if they do get an email from you with wire transfer instructions, they need to let you know, because you know what, I've been hacked. Um, that's how hackers are getting it. Y'all, our Gmail accounts, how secure are those things? I mean, come on, you know, they're about as secure as my closet door, right? So it's easy to get into my email and then send an email from me that looks like it's from me with wire transfer instructions. But guess what? It's not wire transfer instructions to the attorney. It's wire transfer instructions to that offshore account that the hacker is working with. Uh, it's really hard to get it back. One of you just made a comment in the chat, but the attorney always sends it on the email. I know, and the attorney shouldn't. They should not. Uh, I actually went to a wire fraud seminar. It was before COVID, so I guess it was 2019, but it was down in Raleigh, and it was, it was really interesting. It was a joint effort between the North Carolina Real Estate Commission, the North Carolina Bar Association, uh, the FBI was there. Uh, a member of a title insurance company was there. I mean, it was an all-inclusive. It was really interesting. And it was for brokers and attorneys. And they stood there and shook their fingers at the attorneys. And they said, y'all need to stop this. Why are you doing this? Um, I know one thing attorneys may do is send it to me and ask me to forward it on to my clients. And the answer to that is no, because I've already looked my client in the eyeball and told them, I will never email you wire transfer instructions. So are attorneys doing it? Yes. And I don't know when they're going to stop, but that doesn't give us the right to do it. Everybody with me? When it comes to getting wire transfer instructions, we're going to go old school. We're going to tell your buyer or seller to pick up the phone and call the attorneys in the office on a number that they obtained on their own. Don't take it from a number in an email because it could be a phone number from the hacker. So they're going to go to Google. They're going to look the number up on their own or you can provide it to them. And they're going to call and give or receive wire transfer instructions. Some things that we can do as agents for your Gmail, for example, uh, we can turn on two-step verification. So, and I know it's kind of a pain in the butt because you got to put in your password and then it's going to send you a text. And Murphy's Law says it's going to send you a text when your phone's not sitting right next to you. So you got to get up and walk the whole way to the other room and get it. But it's, a, it's an added layer of security. And that way too, you know, if somebody's trying to access your Gmail on a different device because you're going to get notification. There was, a, I'm not going to name any names. But there was a um, online, a, a company that provides an online service that we use, and they sent out this big email not too long ago saying that they were going to update their their security, and they now require the two stamp verification. And I said, great, I don't have a problem with that. But y'all know where they went wrong? You put in your password, and then the next screen told you to put in the phone number. So what's stopping the hacker from putting? their number the hacker's not putting my number in the hacker's putting their number in so i think that was kind of a flaw that should once those bugs get worked out the other thing i want you guys to be cautious about is if you're going to go work at a public place on the public wi-fi let's say tomorrow afternoon or tomorrow morning you go to panera bread 
for breakfast and you're sitting there and you decide you want to get some work done and you jump on Panera Bread's public Wi-Fi. Do you know who can access Panera Bread's public Wi-Fi? The public. So if you have to work, if you have to do something sensitive at Panera Bread, use the mobile hotspot on your phone. Jump on that way. Don't leave yourself open and vulnerable. At that seminar I was at, I sat next to an attorney that was at a large law firm in Raleigh and I had some interesting conversations with her. But she said, she said their IT team would send out false emails to see if the attorneys and the paralegals would, would respond. And if they did, then they like got an immediate, you know, flag and you got to go through this training again and da 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 da. So internally they were working really hard to get the attorneys to stop. Um, but yeah, do not. Guys, this is so bad. My firm pretty much has a policy that says if you forward wire transfer instructions or email them anyway, you're out. And y'all stop using password one, two, three or password one, two, three, four is your passwords. We know this isn't good, right? Stop it. Questions on this? Comments? This is a huge topic. We really could spend all night on it if we wanted to. So then we have the notice information. Our note tells us to insert at least one address and or electronic delivery address. Each party and agent approves for receipt of any notice contemplated by this contract. We're reminded to insert an NA for any which are not approved. So we got the buyer's notice address and the seller's notice address, email, fax, and address. There's several different schools of thoughts on this, whether or not you should complete it or not. What I'm gonna tell you guys is to check with your BIC. Some BICs say, don't give the other agent your client's contact information. Um, some BICs say, well, it's part of the contract, so we need to complete it. I I'm not gonna get involved in the middle of what your BIC tells you. So when it comes to completing the buyer notice address and the seller notice address, get with your BIC and see what they prefer, what the firm's policy is. We definitely need to be completing confirmation of agency notice and address. This is the only place that you and I belong in the offer to purchase and contract. And you'll remember, we are past the contract. The contract piece of it ended when everybody signed. So we're not really part of the offer to purchase and contract. We're on this, let's call this like exhibit A, right? We're on an additional page to it. Buyers are on the left, sellers are on the right. So you got the selling firm name. We need to identify, commission rule requires us to identify our role in writing at the time we're ready to present an offer. So again, thank you forms committee for giving us, all we gotta do is check a box. We don't have to remember to say buyer's agent or seller sub agent, but we do need to identify our role. Selling firm acting as buyer's agent, seller sub agent or dual agent. We're gonna put the firm license number, mailing address, and then we're gonna list the individual selling agent and if you are acting as a designated dual agent. So you would need the firm to act as a dual agent, the agent to act as a designated dual agent. Then you got the selling agent's license number, phone number, fax and email, all applicable however you want the other side, the other agent to communicate with you. And then we go through the same little exercise on the right with the listing firm, acting as the seller's agent or the dual agent, license number, listing agent, and if they're acting as designated dual agent. Comments on that? We gotta have something in here so they know how to communicate with me to tell me that we're under contract, right? To negotiate.
And then the last page is acknowledgement and receipts and monies pretty much, which by the way, we list buyer, seller, property address again, just because it's not uncommon for this last piece of paper to get separated from the contract. So we want to make sure we're all clear on the same page, seller, buyer, property. And pretty much with this form, for the most part, when money changes hands, somebody's got to acknowledge that they've received it. So let's back up. Let's go under contract again. Yay, you're the buyer's agent. We got a contract and you contact your buyers and say, okay, I need to meet you tomorrow morning uh, to get the checks that we talked about. So you meet your buyers in the morning and they give you a due diligence check made out to the seller and they give you an earnest money check made out to the escrow agent. You, the buyer's agent, are gonna deliver the due diligence to the listing agent. Once the listing agent receives it, they're gonna sign acknowledging receipt of the due diligence fee. Can we all go ahead and agree that in your hand and on its way are two totally different things? Everybody good with that? Y'all don't sign this until it's in your hand. Just because they say they're coming by after lunch, can a lot happen between now and after lunch? You better believe it. Guys, there's been cases down at the commission where earn it or due diligence goes missing. The commission investigates. They see the listing agent sign this. And the listing agent says, well, I just signed it and left it at the front desk, but they never dropped it off. So let's make sure we're very clear on that. Do not sign acknowledging receipt of due diligence until you receive it. Then the listing agent is going to deliver it to the seller, at which point they're going to sign acknowledgement of receipt. Buyer's agent will deliver the earnest money to the escrow agent. Escrow agent will acknowledge receipt. And then if we have any additional earnest money, again, escrow agent is going to sign again for that. And you will notice with additional earnest money, on page one, we said that additional earnest money is a time is of the essence. So in addition to the date that it was received, we need a time too, just to make sure it's in compliance and it matches what we said back on page one. And that is our 16 page offer to purchase and contract. Isn't that something? I've always heard every time there's another, there's a lawsuit or a court case, we get something else added to, <laughs> to our contract. I don't know if it's true or not, but it really does make sense. I do know about every year it grows. We're not too, too far away from 17 pages. I don't know how far away, but. We'll probably see it in our careers, if not more. If I may put this in perspective, I bought my little condo in 2006, 12 years ago. In 2006, the offer to purchase and contract was eight pages. We have doubled in 12 years. Ain't that something? What questions or comments do I have about anything in here? Please remember last week, I suggested you look at the fixture list before Thursday night. <clears throat> so please make yourself a note. Fixture list is on page three. By the way, similar to what we were talking about with the Owners Association, um, with the documents from the HOA Owners Association, this very same list of fixtures also shows up in our listing agreement. So we can have the conversation with the seller. Look at this and tell me if you plan to take anything. Because if you plan to take anything, then we need to figure out when you're going to take it, what you're going to replace it with. Is the buyer ever going to see it? Do we have to exclude it? But we have the opportunity in our listing appointment and our listing agreement to get this, get this settled. Yeah. 
the other thing I have to say about our contract, it does update often. So one thing, anytime we have any form update, offer to purchase and contract, agency agreements, amendment, amendment, amendment or addenda, anytime, that was hard, anytime a form, <laughs> a form updates, they provide us, they don't just throw us the new form and say, here you go. Um, NCAR will actually provide a, um, uh, what do they call it? Um, they got a name for it, but they will like show you if they deleted something, they will show you where it was crossed out. If they added something, then they will highlight it, right? Like they will actually show you the changes as opposed to us looking at the old and looking at the new and trying to figure out on our own. So when they update the forms, they have the, um, they have the, we'll call it the working version so we can actually see the changes. Your firms should have at least one sales meeting on the new forms, the updated forms, depending on uh, what, you know, how, how big those changes are. It's rare that we have a really, really, really big change. Um, usually they're just something maybe for clarification or maybe to help simplify things. I think, this is my opinion, remember our part is to fill in the blanks. So we only fill in, you know, we've got a lot to do on page one. We don't do too, too much on page two, uh, a little bit on page three, page four, et cetera. In other words, you guys, our part is so small compared to the overall picture of the whole offer to purchase and contract. And it's easy to get busy and just focus on our part. My recommendation is for you guys to still sit down and read this thing periodically, maybe like once a year when they update the form, because we need to be familiar, not just with the blanks that we fill in, but everything in here. I think that's absolutely one of the best ways we can protect our buyers and sellers is to be familiar with and know what's in here. Remember what we said, they're not reading it. So we need to make sure that we are to best serve them. Any comments? Do you guys get something from this discussion? Did we learn something from this? Do we have a uh, see some heads, Bob's? Good. Good. Same thing with agency agreements. Read those things periodically. Before I started teaching, my rule of thumb was when they updated, it was time for me to sit down and read it. Have you guys done open houses yet? Sometimes you got 20 groups. Sometimes you don't see a soul for two hours. So you need to take stuff with you to do. Isn't that a great opportunity um, if you don't see anybody to sit and read? So the next form we're going to look at is oops, the additional provisions addendum. So remember, this is an addenda, which means it adds to and becomes part of the offer to purchase and contract. And this is the one that provides us with additional provisions that are popular, but not quite popular enough to make it into standard form 2T. I think of all the addenda, this is probably the one that we use the most often. Um, and maybe one day if we start using these provisions more, then we might see it pop up in standard form 2T. But right now they get their own separate addenda. Uh, we're going to start with the property, the seller, and the buyer. We're told that this addenda is attached to and made part of the offer to purchase and contract between the seller and the buyer. Our blue note tells us all of the following provisions which are marked with an X shall apply. Um, those provisions marked NA shall not. So do we need to go through and put an X or an NA in each of these blanks? Well, that's what the note says. That's what we're instructed to do. 
probably one of the two most commonly used one is the expiration of offer. So if your buyer wants an expiration on their offer, we include this offer shall expire unless unconditional acceptance is delivered to on or before this date and time. Time being of the essence, but keep in mind the offer or can always withdraw their offer prior to acceptance, even if you put an expiration date on it. So this offer is good until this date and time or withdrawn by the buyer, whichever occurs first. We have a provision if there's a septic system installation or modification. So as part of the buyer's due diligence, they intend to obtain an improvement permit or a written evaluation from the county health department. A conventional or other ground absorption sewage system for a however many number of bedrooms. Except for the cost of clearing the property, all costs and expenses of obtaining the permit shall be borne on the buyer unless agreed otherwise. Seller is responsible for clearing that portion of the property required by the county to perform its tests no later than, and we're going to put a date in. Um, so let the, you know, give the seller an opportunity to get the land ready for the septic tank, the septic inspection. Rental income or investment property. Uh, property shall be conveyed subject to existing leases or rights of tenants. Seller shall deliver to buyer on or before, again, a date, true complete copies of leases, rental agreements, tenant notices, written statements, tenant security deposits, defaults, et cetera, et cetera. The buyer, if they're buying a home with an existing lease in place, they should have the opportunity during due diligence to also inspect and investigate that. Because remember, they buy honoring the existing lease and tenants. So the seller should provide all those applicable documents. Uh, any security deposit held in connection with the lease shall be transferred to buyer at settlement and otherwise according with the North Carolina Tenant Security Deposit Act. Seller will or will not transfer to buyer any pet fees, deposit fees, at settlement. So if you got a rental property. I think number four is the next biggest agreed upon um, provision in the additional provisions addendum. Agreed upon repairs and or improvements. Seller agrees prior to settlement at seller's expense to complete the following items. Then we're going to list what we want the seller to fix. Let's talk this through for a second. Remember, this is an addendum that we're told is attached and made to the offer to purchase and contract. So in this case, the buyer's asking for repairs and or improvements at the time we're presenting the offer. We're attaching this to the offer to purchase and contract. Now let's understand this has got to be a deal breaker for the buyer, right? When your buyer looks at you and says, I'm not buying this house until this gets fixed. That's when we know we can use this form. This does not negate the buyer's ability to have a home inspection done once we're under contract. This does not negate the buyer's ability to ask for repairs once they've had the inspections in the home, um, the inspections and the investigations. This is something that we're using to ask for at the time that we're presenting the offer. Anybody use this yet? Yep, Karen has. Aaron, I had a, I had buyers once the house they want to make an offer on. It had the buyers didn't have kids, and the backyard had a nice playground. Nice, like all three of us wanted to go play. You know, it was all we had in us not to go jump. It looked like a lot of fun. But my buyer said, we don't have kids. We don't need this. This is where our garden going to go. Can we ask the seller to remove it? I said, sure. So we put it in there. Once they sign this, then they agree to do these repairs prior to settlement. But here's the caution. Here's the warning. Because this is made part of the offer to purchase and contract, this goes to the lender. The lender sends it to the appraiser. The appraiser may not be able to give their opinion and value 
until this agreed upon repair or improvement is complete. So you may want to specifically request it get done in time so when the appraiser goes out, it's complete. Does that make sense? The lender doesn't see the due diligence request and agreement because it's not made part of and attached to the offer to purchase and contract, but this is. Somebody asked about this last week, and I, I apologize, I don't remember who it was, but somebody, I think the question was, what if the buyer wants something repaired before we ever go on a contract? So there's the difference. This one we do before we go on a contract, due diligence request and agreement. Remember, that's the amendment. So what do we use once we're under contract? Due diligence request and agreement. And that's the one we looked at last week. And that amends that one very important sentence. This property is being sold in its current condition. It's an addendum versus an amendment. Questions? Uh, if there's a manufactured mobile home on the property, uh, we're going to identify the VIN number and other descriptions such as year, model, etc. If there's a pool or a spa inspection or preparation, uh, buyer may choose to conduct, shall be at the buyer's expense in accordance with his contract. Any costs associated with putting the pool or spa in operable condition so that it may be properly inspected, including but not limited to pool spa cover removal, filling the pool or spa with water, operating electricity and filtration system. Any costs associated with necessary rewinterizing of the pool following an inspection shall, shall be a responsibility of the, and we're gonna select who's gonna be responsible for getting it ready. If neither is checked, then we're told that the buyer's responsible. If your buyer is buying an outdoor pool or spa this time of year, the thing's probably been winterized. And in order to get it inspected, we need to get it on and winterized. Now, if this is in July and it's operable, it's probably up and running and we don't have to worry about it. This tells us in the event of a conflict between this addendum and this contract, the addendum shall control. So all of our addenda tell us this. If there's a conflict, the addenda is going to control. NCAR and NC bar don't, no representations, the legal validity of this form. If you don't understand it, talk to an attorney before you sign. Buyer signs on the left, seller signs on the right. Questions on this one. You guys use this? Aaron does. I was doing a post licensing class, a gentleman down in Fayetteville, um, big military town. And evidently it's a thing in that part of the state where when sellers go into contract, they don't feel like they have to do lawn maintenance anymore. It's a big enough thing that he says he actually uses this and puts in seller to maintain lawn care until prior to sell. I said, well, aren't you clever? You know, he's, he's combated that. Apparently it's a thing down there. Woohoo, I'm on a contract, I don't have to mow anymore. <laughs> Gosh, we could go like six weeks, right? Four or six weeks, that's a long time. You're walking in a jungle. Funny you say that, Julie, because my daughter is in the army and she's at Fort Bragg and she's buying a house. So I just wrote that down to put that in there. 
<laughs> make sure, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah, it was, you know, that's one thing Zoom's really done is it's opened up my, you know, we don't all work the same across the state. So it's been very, very interesting to learn different practices um, from all around. I mean, even just this call, we got you up in Virginia. I know we got a couple up in, up in King. I mean, we're all over the place. So um, learning all sorts of things. Let's see what else we got. Fun with forms. We're not going through all of them tonight. We'll split them up between night and tomorrow. This is the buyer possession before closing. Now I have two forms, buyer possession before closing and seller possession after closing. And they're both pretty much the same. So you guys are good if we just look at one and know that just the roles reverse uh, depending on which form. So buyer possession before closing. What this says is that the buyer is gonna move in when? before closing. Uh, maybe this is agreed on ahead of times. Maybe this is something that comes up at the, at the settlement table. Uh, for some reason we're delayed and the buyer's hanging out with the U-Haul truck in the parking lot and they have nowhere else to go. So if the parties can agree to do this, um, this could be a solution uh, to the buyer um, or the seller, whatever. Um, but everybody needs to understand some of the consequences, some of the um, fears of going into one of these. So it starts with a big red warning, as a matter of fact, to buyers and sellers. Um, this form may not be used for long-term occupancy, lease purchase, or lease option transactions. This form does not address important issues typically addressed in a residential lease, such as security deposit. Consideration should be given to using the residential rental contract or other residential lease. You are advised to confirm with an insurance professional the terms of the coverage under your property and the casualty insurance policy before using this addendum. Property, seller, and buyer. So we talk with the term of possession, sell access by seller and means of access. Buyer may take possession on the property at 8 a.m. on this date. This agreement shall terminate at the earlier of closing or the termination of the contract. Time is of the essence with regard to the beginning and ending of the term. This was a fairly recent addition. When did we update this one last? This might've been this year. Sellers shall not access the property during the term without buyer's written permission, except in the case of an emergency. Seller shall be entitled to retain an entry key to the property, but shall deliver all other means of access to the property to the buyer on the commencement date. Buyer's waiver. By buyer taking possession of the property on or after the commencement date, buyer waives any further due diligence rights under paragraph four. So if we're still in due diligence and the buyer takes possession, that ends due diligence. They're gonna waive that right. Um, buyer waives the contingency under paragraph 11 relating to the condition of the property and accepts the property in its condition at the commencement date. Buyer waives and acceptance is subject to any agreements between the parties that are part of the contract. Buyer's the one that is now living there, so they have the right to maintain the property. Um, they cannot alter, modify, or damage the property or fail to maintain the property in the same condition as the commencement date and shall make no changes in the property, decorating or otherwise, without the written consent of the seller. Seller shall not be obligated to maintain the property. Um, if closing doesn't occur, buyer shall pay all costs necessary to correct any alteration, modification, or damage um, and to restore the property the condition it was in. The buyer is acting as the tenant, so we got to agree on how much rent they're going to pay. It's all negotiable. Uh, come down to how many days are we talking about here? Buyers shall pay seller a lump sum of X amount for the term. In the event that the buyer is the delaying party under paragraph 12, buyer shall pay additional rent in the sum of X amount per day. So if we have that seven-day delay, 
how much per day. Termination of possession. If the contract is terminated, then buyer shall when? Immediately vacate the property and return all means of access to the seller. Does that say tomorrow? Does that say next week? Does that say when I find a place? They need to go immediately. If buyer does not then immediately vacate, buyer shall continue to be bound by all the terms and conditions and the buyer shall pay the seller a holdover fee of X amount per day for each day buyer remains in possession. Let's see, this is buyer possession. If I were the listing agent, that holdover fee would be hefty. Make it, make it hurt, make it sting. Utilities, buyers shall have all utilities registered in buyer's names. Uh, buyer pays the costs, sewer, gas, water, electricity, et cetera. Buyer's responsible for lawn maintenance and trash removal. Talks about insurance on both parties. Again, the seller's still the owner, so they're gonna have homeowner's insurance. The buyer's acting as the tenant, so they should have renter's insurance. Before anybody signs anything, I recommend you have both parties talk to their insurance agents. Did you guys hear me? Before anybody signs anything, I would have both parties talk to their insurance agent uh, just to make sure. Buyer shall indemnify and hold the seller harmless from and against any all liability fines, suits, claims, et cetera. Um, buyer shall not sublet the property or assign this agreement, so we can't assign. Seller still on the hook for owner's association dues. So the seller is still the name that the HOA has. So they're still responsible for those dues. They could roll that in as part of the rent they expect to collect from the buyer. Are we allowed to have pets? Yes or no? Eviction, in the event of buyer's breach, buyer may be evicted to, from the property pursuant to a summary ejectment um, brought before the magistrate in the county where the property is located. The losing party in any legal proceeding brought by buyer or seller against the other party for breach. Um, yeah, including an, act, an, an action for summary ejectment shall be liable for the costs and expenses of the prevailing party. Again, if there's a conflict between this form and the contract, this form shall control. Buyer signs on the left, seller signs on the right. Seller possession after, pretty much the same thing, just switch the names. Questions on this one? Anybody done one of these? Either of these? Aaron has? Did yours go? Did yours go well? I think you're on Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, it was, I mean, it was standard. We only needed it for a little over a week but it went fine good and, and it's kind of subjective here right it says not to be used for long-term mm -hmm. occupancy well what's long-term occupancy right. um, but remember we don't have a security deposit we don't have a full rent so that's why it goes on to address using the residential rental contract um, if the residential rental contract doesn't apply to the situation then we have an attorney draft a lease up Aaron, from talking to other agents out there in the world, I think you and I are awfully lucky because I've heard horror stories of these things going wrong. Mine too went very smooth. I've done one of each, a buyer possession before closing and a seller possession after closing. Mm. And both of mine went really well. And in talking to other agents, I'm really lucky. I don't oh, say that to scare anybody. I just say that to make sure that you educate yourself, talk to the attorney, talk, make sure your clients talk to the insurance uh, make sure everybody knows what they're getting themselves into before they get into this. And I, I try to use it as the absolute last resort. 
yeah, right. We're not going to bring this up as the first, mm -mm. Mm -mm. you know. <laughs> no. And I'll tell you, you know, like my buyer possession before closing, because I had to go by the house before closing for some reason anyway. And my buyers, I mean, they, they, ha they didn't hang a picture. They had all the pictures lined up on the wall where they were going to go. So all they had to do after closing was just, you know, put them up. Put them but they were all lined up on the floor along the wall, but they didn't hang anything. Um, my seller possession after closing, man, they left that house in immaculate condition for the new owners. They left a dang gift, gift basket. You know, it was a really, um, they got stuck in a situation. Their new construction got delayed as it usually does. And they had, y'all ready for this? Three kids all under the age of five. Let that sink in. And they said, if we can only move these kids once, <laughs> that would be ideal. And it worked out, you know, my buyers weren't ready to move in yet anyway. And so that one was about four or five days, um, but they were very appreciative of my buyers for letting them do that. So just proceed with caution, educate yourself, attorneys, insurance agents, et cetera. Questions on this one? Let's take a break. When we come back, we're gonna switch gears from forms a little bit. We're gonna put forms away for the, for the evening. Uh, but when we come back, we're gonna do some math. So grab a calculator, grab some blank paper and a pencil. Uh, and we're gonna do some proration problems.
Welcome back. Hey, Julie. Mm -hmm. The um, test, it, when we have these problems, is it going to be on the screen or is it something we can print and write on or? No, it's all on the screen. So we, we give the test uh, through a program called Class Marker. And this email that you have from Lane that you click on the Zoom link, uh, we got a little tutorial here on what Class Marker is going to look like and what you can expect. So I recommend you look at that, you know, in the next couple of days and give you an idea. So we can, can we use um, scrap paper and write it down so we can reference it or no? I mean, you can have scratch paper, sure. Okay. Sure. I don't know about writing it down because um, we're going to see we have, but you can make notes and, you know, but as far as copying the whole thing word for word, no. I'm just going to have to transfer mine to a bigger screen, I think. Yeah, a monitor or something. Yeah, I'm blind. It's it's only one question per screen. So, you oh, know. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Fun. You answer the question, you hit next. You answer the question, hit next. So, oh. again, if you're not familiar with Class Marker, watch this tutorial and it'll show you, it'll show you what to expect. Okay. So, if you guys will look in the chat, uh, I uploaded the document that we're getting ready to look at now. So, please pull up your chat. And you should be looking at something that looks like this. Everybody see this? Or do you have it? You need access to it. So if you guys can open it and either save it or just have it available on your computer. We're not going to go through all of these in class just because we don't have time. Um, I will put the solutions in Learn Test Pass. If not tonight, then it won't be tonight. But first thing tomorrow morning, I'll put the solutions in. I just reworked this before class, so that's why I don't have the solutions yet. But what I want to do now is just take like 10 or 15 minutes, and I'm going to put you guys in a breakout room. So I'm going to let you guys work together on some of these problems. Um, you know, I'm going to put you in three to a room so you guys can have an opportunity to work together. Please don't spend all your time chit chatting. Um, I know it's hard. We want to socialize, but remember, we got a test to take on Thursday as well. Particularly, I would like you guys to especially focus on uh, the first one. We're going to prorate rent. And I would like you guys to work the fifth one which is interim interest. So I'm gonna put you guys in a breakout room. You're gonna work one in five, about 15 minutes. If you have time, feel free to do two, three, or four. Everybody hear what I'm saying? So one in five, and we'll go through those together in class. And like I said, I'll put the solution to all of these and learn test pass first thing tomorrow morning. So if you work the whole worksheet, you can, you can have that there. Questions about what we're getting ready to do. We're getting ready to do math, yay. Does everybody have the worksheet? Everybody have the problem pulled up where you can see it? Okay, so hang on to your hats. You're getting ready to get thrown into a breakout room. They randomly assign you. So I don't know who you're gonna be with. That's part of what makes it fun. And like I said, I'll give you about 15 minutes. So here you go.
We got cut off. You did? <laughs> I got thrown back to, right back at you. <laughs> <laughs> I should have given you guys like a 60 second, but I think you have the option to leave too. Just so long. I guess I should have said this before. Leave the breakout room. Don't leave the call. <laughs> that's a that's oh. a big difference right there. <laughs> if you do leave the call by accident, that's okay. Just click on the link and I'll let you back in. So, well, first off, was that fun? I know fun and math don't really go in the same sentence, <laughs> but um, <laughs> uh, I think that kind of gives us an opportunity at least to, to, to work with your peers for just a second. Um, I know that's one thing we miss about being on Zoom is like, you know, each other. So hopefully you, you enjoyed that. And did you guys get through uh, number one and number five at least? Did you guys get through those? Okay, good. Um, first off, do we have any questions before we look at those two together? Like I said, we're just gonna do one in five right now. And then um, I've worked these. I just wanna double check my math to make sure, um, but I'll have these available to you guys in Learn Test Pass tomorrow morning, by tomorrow morning. So you can do these for good practice to get ready for your test on Thursday. Julie, I do have a question. Yes. Um, and I think you've already answered this, but I just want to clarify for most of these, unless it is specifically stated, besides interim interest, we are to assume that it is the seller's responsibility on the day of closing. Correct. Okay. Great. Unless you're told otherwise. Absolutely. Great. Thank great. you. Thank you. So that brings us to this one, which makes, we got to think a little bit differently with rent. So let's talk about this one. First off, we're going to read the problem. A seller has collected September rent from all five tenants. Two of them pay 345 per month, month each, three pay 425 per month each. How much rent will be prorated at a September 19th closing? So somebody talked to me, what did you guys do? What was the first thing you did? We um, totaled up the amount of rent. We had to figure yeah. out rent first, right? So we know we're collecting $345 from two units. So I'm going to get $690. We know I'm collecting $425 from three units. And that's going to give me $1,275. So first off, Amanda, we need to figure out how much rent are we actually going to collect. So when we add the two together, I get total monthly rent of $1,965. Mm -hmm. Questions so far? Now we get to do our proration. And guys, I'm very serious when I say this. When it comes time to y'all prorating, I want you to draw it out. I want you to see what it is that you're prorating. So in this case, what we're prorating is rent for the month of September with closing happening on September 19th. So by drawing it out, what I can determine here, the seller owns a property for the first part of September, the buyer owns a property for the latter part of September. What divides September is the day of closing. Did you guys draw it out? Yeah. Some of you? Good. I find it really helpful. So the tenant paid rent on September 1st to the seller for the entire month. That's how rent works. Now that we're changing hands on the 19th, now we got to stop and ask ourselves, who owes whom? The seller owes the buyer. The 19th, the tenant is the sellers. The 20th, the tenant becomes, we can't really call him the buyer at this point, can we? Now the tenant becomes the new owner. So the seller owes the tenant for rent from tomorrow through the end whoops, of the month. 
October 1st, the tenant's going to pay the new owner, right? So we don't have to worry. We just got to hash out this month of rent. Um, is that 10 days? No, if you said yes, you just got it wrong. Not because you don't know what you're doing, but because you didn't count right. So how do we, um, how do we fix this? How do we make sure we count right? Actually Thursday. count it out. You got them, they can't, I can't take them from you on Thursday. So use them. So you got the 20th, the 21st, 22nd, 23rd, 24th, 25th, 26th, 27th, 28th, 29th, and the 30th. There are 11 days left in September that the seller owes, yeah, seller owes the buyer for rent. Monthly rent was 1965. We need to break this down to daily. There are 30 days in the month of September. So we're looking at $65.50 per day. We've already determined the seller is the buyer for 11 days. 11 times 65.5, whoops. Gives us a debit to the seller, credit to the buyer for $720.50. We're gonna hash it out at settlement. We're gonna make this, make this work at settlement. The seller, Debit the seller, credit the buyer. Is this fair now? Up until the 19th, the tenant was the sellers. Then on the 20th, they became the buyers. Once you get the, once you get the name as the landlord on your lease, you can start collecting rent. What questions do I have? Do we get it? First off, I see head bobs. Good, good. Do we have any questions on this one? You added a step. What did you do? Okay, so you figured out um, the first through the 19th, and then you deducted that from the 1965. Did you get 72050? Perfect. Perfect. Sometimes, you know, the 19th is funny because it kind of falls in the middle of the month. But sometimes, Allison, you can use that trick. If closing was like the second, for example, we could figure out the sellers and then deduct that. That would save us from less count, you know. So sometimes you can use that trick. As long as you got as long as you got B, you know, that's one thing on your, I'm not going to ask to see your guys' work. I don't care how you get there. Just get there. Did you guys ever have that happen to you in high school where you had points deducted from you because you didn't do the math problem the same way the teacher, oh, that drove me nuts. There's more than one way to see math and do math. And as long as you get B, I'm very happy. I'm not gonna be that, that math teacher. Mine was Mrs. Cheryl. I remember her like yesterday, dang it. <laughs> Other questions or comments on number one? Again, two, three, four are still good rent proration problems, kind of walk us through all the different scenarios. So I encourage you guys to look at that. The other one I ask you guys to work together as a group is number five, which is about interim interest. So the settlement date, again, draw it out. Let's see what we're looking at here. We're gonna to go to closing on September 19th. If we go to closing on September 19th and we're, the buyer's originating a new loan, as the information down here, when is this buyer's first mortgage payment gonna be due? We go to closing on the 19th. When is their first mortgage payment? Why don't everybody tell me in the chat? Let's hear from everybody, private chat. We go to closing on the 19th. When is their first mortgage payment going to be due? Okay. 
Okay, so it looks like we're good. Whenever we originate a new loan, we can skip the first first. So the first first is October. There is no mortgage payment due on December, which means as you guys told me, their first mortgage payment is due on November 1st. And when they make that payment in November 1st, interest is paid in arrears. Remember, we all looked at where our rears were. Our rear is where? It's behind us. So when you make that payment on November 1st, your buyer is paying October's interest. Which means, put yourself in the lender's shoes. Doesn't the lender want to collect some interest? Don't they want some money from the day they originated the loan? To the end of the month to get them caught up. And that's what interim interest is. Questions just to this point. We'll work the whole problem in a second, but I want to see what questions I have so far. Yeah. Yeah, but what about in what about interest for 919 to 101? They will pay the interest on 101 when they make November's payment. So what interim interest is, is 919 to the end of the month. That's what the lender is going to collect at closing. Okay. Did I answer? Yes, thanks. Um, is that 11 days? No. You guys got to count it out. Once you whip out your magical fingers, we're going to see... See why I want you guys to count it out? It's so easy to look at that and see 11 days. And guess what? You just missed the whole problem. Seriously, guys, use these things to your advantage. So the 19th through the 30th is 12 days that the buyer owes the lender for interest. Are we going to figure out how much based off of the sales price or the loan amount? Loan amount. See some mouths moving? Absolutely. Anything to do with the lender? What does the lender care about? Loan amount. The lender cares about the loan amount. So anything to do with the lender. So to find daily interest, we first need to take the balance, or in this case, the day of settlement is the loan amount. And we're going to times it by the interest rate. Balance times the interest rate gives me annual interest. I need to take annual interest and break it down to daily. So you take annual interest, divide it by 365 days on our calculator, we get a number three, six, nine, eight, something like that. If you want to round, just say 0. 0.014, at least go out three decimal places. So I have daily interest. We've already decided 12 days. So the buyer owes their lender. Looks like I'm a few cents off there, probably from rounding. But again, if you got 276.16, couldn't you look at the answer and tell that this one is B is the, the closest? So that's what I mean by you can't get it wrong by rounding alone. Some of these answer choices are based off of you figuring it off the sales price. Um, I think one of them is based on you figuring it all in, loan origination fee, discount points. That's not what the question asked you for, though, is it? It asks you how much for interim interest. So do we get B? Head bobs? Do we have any questions? Okay. Comments? Concerns? You guys, please remember to do, again, I'll put these answers in Learn Test Pass in the morning, um, but you guys, please remember to do, let's go out there right now and look at it. If you haven't done it already, please remember to go into Learn Test Pass and it's section 6B, 
First off, don't forget you need some blank CDs for the test on Thursday, at least one blank CD. If you wanna bring a backup, I'm okay with that. I just need to verify that it's all blank. So we're gonna do a little check-in one-on-one and I need you to show me. So if you want a backup, I'm fine, okay? But I need to see it. Um, and then the one we're gonna do in class tomorrow is closing problem four. <laughs> you don't like that, do you? <laughs> <laughs> That's that rounding thing. Questions? We will do our settlement statement probably first thing tomorrow. And you know what? You guys can do it ahead of time the faster we get through it. If you're seeing it for the first time tomorrow night, it's going to take us a while. So it's kind of up to you guys. Fair enough. I've seen it. I know what it's about, but I don't have to take tests on Thursday. I've already taken my tests. Good. Good, good. Practice, practice, practice. We are going to get back to our PowerPoint. Um, before we leave tonight, I'll kind of recap what, uh, just kind of recap what tomorrow's gonna look like. We got a lot to do tomorrow, um, but we're getting through it. So back to our PowerPoint, back into chapter 11 is where we are. Um, and we're just coming off of our very, I would call it a very thorough review. This is line by line, but I'd say it's pretty thorough um, of our standard offer to purchase and contract. Remember you guys, always remember, you have the guidelines to complete. So once you have access into NCAR, you have the guidelines to complete many forms and they usually update those guidelines when they are updating the forms. So as 2T updates, they update the guidelines, et cetera. So please make sure you're always referencing those. And then while you still have a manual, on uh, chapter 11, starting on page 329, if, if you're a hard book person, I caution you because I know things have changed since they printed this book. So one last plug, one last push for the digital version. Um, when you're in practice, at least when they make a change, they can update the digital version. And I don't know about you, but $25 for a two-year subscription sounds much better than $50 for a book that is probably going to be out of date by, you know, halfway through next year. So just something for you, another tool for you to have in your tool belt to help us get through these transactions. So what we need to do now is kind of go back and let's have a little conversation just specifically about earnest money. Let's just talk about earnest money and make sure we're good with how this works. So the earnest money, first off, is always negotiable. I think I mentioned last week, the Real Estate Commission is very helpful when it comes to earnest money. And they say whatever the buyer is willing to offer and the seller is willing to accept. So if the buyer offers 75 cents and the seller accepts it, Congratulations, we have formed a contract with 75 cents on earnest money. Is that going to satisfy the seller if the buyer terminates an hour before closing? Probably not, but it's a negotiable amount. The whole point of the earnest money is for the buyer to show their good faith. Sellers want to know that they have a serious buyer interested in their property. I'm sorry, sellers want to know, excuse me, that they have a serious buyer interested in their property. Sellers want to know that buyers have a little bit of money in the bank. They want to know that they have some money that they can deposit to show their good faith. And remember paragraph 23 of our contract, explain the seller's remedy. Liquidated damages says if the buyer breaches, Earnest money deposit and the due diligence fee is all the seller gets. It is their sole and exclusive remedy. 
now. Um, if the buyer, remember we talked about the buyer, their home inspector damaging the property, uh, the seller may have to be able to go after them for that if they're not willing to pay. All we're meaning with the seller's sole remedy is the seller's sole remedy for the buyer's breach. Buyer's not considered in breach until after due diligence. So our due diligence fee and our earnest money deposit. The contract tells us that the earnest money is due to the escrow within five days of the effective date. Please remember when we're talking about days in a contract, a day is a day is a day. So if we go under contract today, we always start counting the day after um, receipt or the day after effect. So if we go under contract today, tomorrow is Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Well, Sunday is day five. Are there going to be banks open on Sunday? Mm, probably not, but we can still receive it due within five days. Tell your sellers to get it in the bank as soon as they can. I'm sorry, not the earnest money. Never mind. Forget I just said that. Uh, the, S the earnest money we're going to deliver to an escrow agent. Obviously, you won't be able to take it to the attorney on Sunday um, or the real estate firm. So you want to make sure you go. It's in your receipt on Sunday <coughs> and get it to where it needs to go Monday morning. Once it's been received, once the escrow agent receives it, they now have three banking days to deposit it. Now, this says three banking days of receipt or contract formation. So let's talk about that word or. We go under contract. We have five days to get it to the escrow agent. Once the escrow agent gets it, they have three days of receipt, three days from receipt to deposit it. What if? In the throes of negotiations, we're not under contract yet, we're still negotiating, and the buyer hands their agent their earnest money deposit check and says, hang on to this for me until a contract is formed. In that case, we're not going to deposit it because the buyer doesn't owe any money until and if we have a contract. So in this case, we're going to keep it. Your BIC is going to keep it in their safekeeping until we have contract formation. And then that starts our three-day clock. So three banking days of receipt or contract formation. If we are holding the earnest money deposit during negotiations and the contract isn't formed, the offer never becomes a contract, then we need to get that earnest money back to the buyer. Again, they do not owe any money until and if a contract is formed. You may want to deliver it back to your buyer. Your buyer may say shred it or write void on it, whatever. Follow their instructions. It is their money after all. So make sure you follow their instructions if the contract is never formed. Any questions on this? Anybody ever had a buyer ask him to hold earnest money? No? I did once. He, he flew up from Florida and he was here like Monday through Friday. And so we went, looked at properties Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And then Friday morning, we looked at his couple favorite and then he figured out which one. So by the time he was getting on a plane, I was writing his offer. And he did leave me his earnest money check because he felt really strong about it. It was a decent earnest money. And he did leave me his check. He landed. I had a offer ready for him to sign. We got it negotiated under contract and I had the earnest money in my possession. I could go ahead and, and deliver it. If that offer never became a contract, um, I just have to find out from him what he wanted me to do with it. We talked about what happens if the seller breaches. Um, you know, they're going to have to give up the due diligence. They're going to have to give up earnest money. They owe the buyer due diligence costs or the buyer can sue for specific performance. They have a choice to make in the event of the seller breach. Again, you guys, if the buyer's going for the money, the due diligence fee, the earnest money and the due diligence costs and the seller is not willing to sit down and write out a check, the buyer can sue. 
What happens to the earnest money if the buyer terminates within their due diligence period? What do we do with the earnest money? They get the earnest money back. The buyer will get their earnest money back. That's part of what mm -hmm. this is about. That's right, refunded to the buyer. So if we terminate within due diligence, they have exercised their right to terminate. They're not in breach. The only thing they lose at this case is the due diligence fee, which is what they paid for was that right to terminate. So the buyer will get it back. Uh, what happens if the buyer terminates at 501 on the due diligence date? The buyer um, loses the due diligence. Um, they lose due diligence. Um, they lose earnest money as well, right? That's right. Yep. So if we terminate after due diligence for any reason, and guys, that includes failure to get loan approval. If we terminate for any reason after due diligence, if the buyer terminates, the seller will still keep the due diligence fee. And now the seller gets the earnest money. And the two together are the seller's liquidated damages. Enough of this doom and gloom. What if we actually get this thing to closing? What happens to the earnest money? What happens to the due diligence fee? They count toward the overall price of the property. That's right. Both will be credited to the buyer at settlement. They've already paid that money once. They're not gonna be expected to pay it again. So if we make it to closing, we're gonna see a credit for the due diligence and a credit to the earnest money. Remind me again, how many of you, this is your third post-licensing class? How many of you are gonna be done Friday night? Look at all, yeah, me, me, me. Okay, so a lot of you are really close, this is it. Um, right now though, you're still a provisional broker and provisional brokers cannot walk around with somebody else's money. So if your buyer gives you an earnest money check tomorrow and says, will you hang on to this for me while we're negotiating? You need to run, not walk, but run and get that check to your broker in charge. PBs cannot walk around with somebody else's money. Full brokers should not. Guys, this is why your BICs make the big bucks. Think about this. When you have somebody else's money in your hand, it's your responsibility. So my suggestion to you is always get it to where it needs to go, no matter who you are. Again, commission rule says provisional brokers cannot walk around with somebody else's money. If for some reason your buyer hands you a big wad of cash for their earnest money deposit, we need to get that in the bank. The escrow agent needs to get that in the bank within three banking days of receipt, even if a contract has not been formed. Because if we're in the throes of negotiation and they give you $5,000 in cash, do you want to be responsible for that? No. Do you think your BIC wants to be responsible for that? Probably not. Now, your firm may have a policy that says we don't accept cash, but in the event, here we are. Even if a contract hasn't been formed, cash is readily available. So if they give you the check today and the offer is terminated tomorrow, we can still write a check back to the buyer and get them that money back. We don't have to wait for cash to clear the bank. Questions so far? Let's take our last break. We'll come back and finish it up for the night.
we good for the last hour? Not even, we're down to like 45 minutes. So remember as you start getting heavy eyed in this last, I know this last one's the, the hard one. So if you get heavy eyed, please feel free to stand up and stretch or jumping jacks off camera or, or whatever you need to do. Um, hopefully you're not doing shots of caffeine during the break because then, or shots of anything, let's be clear. Um, hopefully, <laughs> so that, <laughs> that you can still sleep tonight. All right. So talking about our earnest money deposit, um, there is a commission rule that addresses handling of trust money. Now you don't need to know the rule. Know that there's a commission rule solely just on trust account, trust money. And within this commission rule, there's something that says that in addition to earnest money deposit, we can also receive other monies for the purpose of playing delivery man. So for example, I am allowed per this commission rule, we are allowed to deliver the due diligence check. The only reason it's in my hand is because we're delivering it from the buyer to the listing agent or the listing agent to the seller. We're somehow working on getting the two together. Um, another thing covered under this rule would be an option money. If you had an option fee, we'll talk about options briefly tomorrow night. This commission rule says that when that due diligence fee or that option fee is in our possession, we follow our buyer's instructions. So let's say you are the buyer's agent and you go under contract, yay, and you meet your buyer and you get those checks. You get your due diligence check and you get your earnest money check. And you have those checks in your possession and you are en route to deliver them. You're taking the due diligence to the listing firm. You're taking the earnest money to the escrow. And while you are en route, your buyer calls you and says, don't deliver those checks. This commission rule says we need to follow our buyer's instructions. Can I say something like the seller may give you one day written notice and require readily available funds and if they don't get it, then they can terminate? Yeah, but guys, what we need to understand is it's not my money to decide what to do with. So when your buyer calls you and says, do not, do not deliver those checks, turn around, get them back to your buyer or do whatever they say. Of course, we can give them that caution, but we have to follow their directions because it is their money. There is another commission rule that talks about the disputed earnest money deposit. Now we talked about this uh, with our contract, but this is a good time for us to review it. If we terminate for any reason, no matter who terminates, seller terminates, buyer terminates, doesn't matter. Contract's pretty clear about what happens to the earnest money and the due diligence if we terminate. However, before the earnest money can be released, both parties have to agree to release it. They sign the termination agreeing to release the earnest money to the appropriate party. If either party is unwilling to sign that termination to release the earnest money, the earnest money is in dispute. And the escrow agent can't make the final decision about what to do with the earnest money deposit, even though that's what the contract says. Remember, the escrow agent is the third party. The money is between the buyer and the seller. So if that money's in dispute, the escrow agent hangs on to it, tries to get, you know, maybe they send a letter via certified mail or something, uh, trying to get them to release it. But after a certain amount of time, if the earnest money hasn't been released, then the escrow agent can turn it over to the clerk of courts and let the two go downtown and hash it out in front of a magistrate. The escrow agent cannot make decisions about what happens to somebody else's money. They're simply acting as an impartial holding ground.
What questions do we have about earnest money? Moving right along, continuing on in chapter 11, uh, my hard book people are on page 357. My digital people, we are under sales contract procedures. So in this section, we're gonna talk about submitting offers to sellers, how we can do that. Uh, we're gonna discuss multiple offers. Uh, we're going to review, do a quick review on offer modifications and counter offers. This is another good opportunity for us to review that magic moment in time when it goes from being an offer to a contract. So to create a valid contract, first off, there has to be an offer made. And then we have to have these two things that magic moment in time when we go from an offer to a contract. So we have to have acceptance. Um, all parties have to agree to all terms. If you have verbal, what do you have? Verbal acceptance, what you got? Absolutely nothing. So we wanna make sure it's in writing. Remember y'all's knee jerk reaction when that other agent calls you and says, my guys have accepted. What are you gonna say or what are you gonna ask? I guess I should ask, what are you gonna ask? Has it been signed? If you got verbal, you got nothing. So we have all parties accept, we have all parties sign. And then we have to have communication of acceptance to the person that made the offer the offer or the person that made the offer has got to know that their offer has been accepted. So if we look at the terms, who we're talking about here, the people, and we draw our line, and I do encourage you to draw the line for the test so you can walk this thing back and forth. Most of the time, the buyer's going to be the offer or making the offer to the seller. Again, I don't want you guys to get that stuck in your head though. I mean, that's what happens the majority of the time, but could the seller make an offer to sell to the buyer? Could the seller make an offer first? Absolutely. So what I would rather you guys focus on is the offer or and the offeree. Who is the person giving the offer and who is the person receiving the offer? We're just gonna use this scenario of the buyer making the offer to the seller because that's what we see the majority of the times. Buyer makes offer to seller, seller's the offeree, seller has three choices. Y'all wanna walk through them together? What can the seller do? They can accept it, reject it, or counter it. If they accept it, they agree to all the terms, communication of acceptance happens and poof, we're under contract. If they reject it, it's dead on the table. Once it's dead on the table, there's no going back. You can't revive a rejected offer. Could you go back later and make an exact same offer with those terms that you rejected? Yes, but it's a brand new offer. Everybody with me? You're not reviving the one that you rejected. Our third choice is a counter offer. A counter offer is a rejection. It's a rejection with a but. I'm good with all these terms, but this, this, and this. And with a counter offer, the roles reverse. The seller is now making the offer to the buyer. We've already agreed to all these other terms. But now we still got to agree on the whatever fell after the but. We're good with everything but this, this, and this. So now we got to agree on those. If the, if the uh, buyer counters, the roles reverse again, right? Every time we have a counter offer, those roles reverse. 
And this is why I highly recommend you guys draw this out on your scratch paper for the test. Because I'm not kidding when I say this, you're going to get a scenario, the paragraph's going to be like this long, and you're going to have some counters, and you're going to have to figure out when, at exactly what point in time we are under contract. Um, hopefully you've had the opportunity to look at some questions in Learn Test Pass. I know there's some scenarios uh, that walk you through. Um, and the, you know, the thing I like a whole lot about Learn Test Pass is it tells you not only if it's right or wrong, but why. So make sure you're doing those to get ready for Thursday as well. So the seller counters, the buyer accepts, um, and we verify, you as their agent verify. I forgot to put agents in here. My goodness, I forgot all about us. So each party, there we go, has an agent. Now we're in. So the buyer accepts the seller's offer and they sign. The buyer calls their agent and says, I've accepted. Do your head one way or another. Did communication of acceptance cross the line when the buyer called their agent did communication of acceptance cross the line? No. So are we under contract? No, I'm one step closer, but I'm not under contract yet. Buyer's agent then calls listing agent. Did communication cross the line? Yeah, congratulations, we're under contract. Remember, when it comes to contract formation and negotiations, Communicating with the agent is just as good as communicating with my client. Once you tell me your guys accept, I'm going to say, yeah, but have they signed? And you say, yeah, 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 they signed. Boom, we're under contract. The other thing I cautioned you guys to look out for the test. Again, that question is like this wrong. So I called you and left a voicemail. And then I went home and I sent you an email with the attached offer or at this point the attached contract which form of communication put us under contract which one put us under contract i see mal's mute voicemail that's right that's right it's the voicemail that put us under contract even though you don't have it in your possession yes yet i communicated acceptance and that's what we're looking for here is communication of acceptance. Now, obviously you need me to email you. And I say, yeah, 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 I'm on my way back to the office right now. As soon as I get there, I'll shoot you an email. But we're under contract when I called you or left you that voicemail. Does that make sense to everybody? What questions do I have on this? This is important. This magic moment in time. I felt really bad one time I was I was doing an open house and this couple came in and um you know welcome and they were looking around and they got done and they were leaving and I said did you guys have any questions about the property and they said no they said we're we're feeling a little defeated they said we we had an offer in and and um the seller verbally accepted and as soon as they said that I thought Oy, I know where this is going so the seller verbally accepted but guess what happened before we could actually get a signature? A better offer came swooping in. Which one did the seller sign? The better offer. But this is what bothered me about that. Then that couple looked at me and said, we don't play that game. And I thought, well, it's not really a game, is it? It's like contract law. Um, I don't know if there was a miscommunication. I didn't ask a lot of questions because, you know, um, they just felt overall, they felt defeated. They thought they had the property, but it's just a good reminder that if you got verbal, you got absolutely nothing. If you guys ever get to do a transaction with me and you call me and tell me you're under, con you, we got acceptance and we're under contract, you might as well go ahead and send me the contract as soon as you can, because I'm going to be like that little gnat until I get it. Where's my contract? Where's my contract? Where's my contract? I got your phone number. I can text you. I can call you. I got your email. I get in touch with your BIC. Just go ahead and send it so everybody has it, gets what they need, and I can get off your case. Questions on this? 
I want to see it. The offer or is the person giving the offer. They are free to revoke their offer at any time prior to acceptance, even if they put an expiration date on it. So remember our additional provisions addendum that we looked at earlier tonight. And I can put an expiration date on my offer. And it says the offer is good until whatever date and time or until the buyer revokes their offer. The offer or is free to revoke their offer at any time prior to acceptance. So then we got the acceptance. An offer must be accepted and acceptance needs to be communicated to the person making the offer. It's twofold. We got to have both steps. We have acceptance, written signature acceptance, and then communication of acceptance crosses the line. And guys, remember, we just went on about a rejection kills the offer. A counter offer is a rejection as well. So once you counter it, you've killed the offer, presented a new offer with those new terms. Once again, there is no going back. So one thing we need to do as brokers is make sure that we promptly communicate acceptance. I don't know about you guys, but let's say you and I are negotiating a deal on behalf of our clients and um, your client calls you, let me see, you're working with a buyer or seller, doesn't matter to me. And your client calls you and says, I've accepted, I've signed. And you say, great. And you hang up the phone with your client. And before you call the other agent, you got some errands to run and you got to do this and you got to run an appointment, da, 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 and I'll get to it later tonight. Can a lot happen between now and later tonight? Absolutely. Guys, pull over and send a text. Let your client know, let the other agent know, excuse me, because I cannot imagine me not effectively communicating and then come to find out my client loses the property, either the seller doesn't get the buyer, or the buyer doesn't get their dream home because I couldn't communicate effectively. Do we have a happy client at this point? Absolutely not. So make sure that we are promptly communicating acceptance. Make sure that as you get in the throes of negotiations that you're available. Um, <laughs> I, you know, do we like to take vacation sometimes? I don't know about you guys, but I, I'm itching for the beach. We're going down in a couple of weeks. I'm on countdown, very excited. I think if the president of the United States of America can take a vacation, so can real estate agents. I think we should be able to do that. But before you go on vacation, especially if you have a listing or if you have a buyer that's in the throes of negotiations, ask somebody to help you out. Ask your BIC or somebody in the firm to help you out so your client doesn't miss out on the deal while you're running away for the weekend. There's an old saying in this industry. It says, if you ever want to sell a house, just go on vacation. And I think it's very, very true. I promise you, about the time you're pulling your suitcase out of the closet, your phone is going to blow up. You had that listing that hasn't had a showing in three months when you're packing. Yeah, now you got five showings. It's just the nature of the business. So it's okay to ask your peers for help. Nobody is expecting you to work 365 days out of the year. So it's okay to ask for help. Just make sure you have that backup. Make sure you have that coverage. And you know what? You scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. So when you go on vacation, I'll be happy to help and vice versa. Any comments on this? It breaks my heart when I hear about poor communication. And I mean, it's kind of our job, you know? If you're in the throes of negotiations, you may need to uh, excuse yourself from the family table 
dinner table to respond to a text or an email. You may need to step aside from your kid's soccer game for a second. I'm not telling you, you got to miss the whole game or the whole meal, but that's part of what we signed on for, wasn't it? Was to be available when our buyers and sellers needed us. And I think that absolutely applies to getting them under contract. I had a seller once. It was before this crazy market we were in. And we were probably on the market four or five months, nothing crazy. And sure enough, where were we going? I think we were going to Charlotte for the weekend. And sure enough, I got like three offers, you know, right before we left. So I'm like, made my husband drive. I'm dealing with it on the way to Charlotte. As soon as we checked into the hotel, I whipped out my laptop and, you know, figured it out. I had backup, but I also knew I could do this and we went my husband and I are really big baseball fans so we went to a Charlotte Knights game that weekend the little baseball team and I'm on the phone at the Charlotte Knights stadium trying to negotiate this thing trying to get it under contract I'm trying to find a quiet place at the Charlotte Knights stadium uh, so I can get this I got it verbally under contract before the end of the night um, got it signed the next morning Have y'all ever looked for a quiet place to have a phone conversation at a ball field? Yeah, that's kind of hard to do. <laughs> we do what we have to do though. So let's talk about submitting offers to sellers. Now there's a couple of different schools of thoughts on this, if you will, and we're gonna see that they're pretty similar. So the law of agency tells us that we have a duty to present all offers to the seller. Everybody see that word all? Each and every single one of them. What about the low ball offer that's just going to make your seller mad? Just going to insult them and make them mad. Do I have to present it? Yep. Because we present which offers? All of them. Law of agency says we have a duty to present these as soon as possible. And at that time, we need to disclose any information that we may have that may affect the seller's decision. Do we know something about the buyer? Do we know something about the buyer's financing or loan approval or what they're looking for, their motivation or their terms, how high they're willing to go? So the law of agency says all offers as soon as possible. The real estate commission is close. They're very parallel. Real Estate Commission requires all brokers to deliver immediately, all offers immediately, but in no event later than how many days? Anybody remember how many days the commission gives us to deliver? I see some hands. And I would agree. Commission says we need to deliver these immediately but in no event later than three days, once again, deliver all offers. So they're pretty close. Law of agency del says deliver as soon as possible. Commission says immediately, but in no event later than three days. Don't sit on offers. I don't understand why this is a problem. I wanna know, has anybody sat on an offer? Because I wanna know why. I yeah, don't right, that's get a great it. question. I know, like, like y'all understand we don't make money if this doesn't close, right? I mean, in order to close, you have to have an offer. It's like, <laughs> you know, cause and effect. Mm -hmm. By the way, let's talk about this submitting offers to sellers. I think where our minds immediately go is the listing agent delivering to their seller client. But what if you're a buyer's agent going after for sale by owner? When do I have to deliver that offer to the FISBO? Immediately, but in no event later than three days. So it doesn't matter that you're not talking directly. I mean, one way or another, you're talking directly to the seller, either the listing agent communicating directly with the seller or the buyer's agent communicating directly with the seller. Back to being a listing agent. Again, we need to notify the seller um, if we know of any other possible offers that might be coming, um, once again, have you guys ever gotten a call after a showing 
where the agent says, my buyers love it. We're going to go home and write it up and you'll hear from me this afternoon. And then you never talk to that agent again. What happened? I don't know. But obviously they decided not to deliver an offer. But that doesn't mean that if we have an offer and I heard of one coming, that doesn't mean that I should, still shouldn't let my seller. Um, let me ask you guys this. You have, that you have an offer in your hand and you hear of another offer that's coming this afternoon. Do you have to, if the offer you have in your hand is really, really good, do you have to wait for the offer this afternoon? Do you have to hold up and wait? Nah, the seller's free to accept any offer at any time that they want. What if the offer you have in your hand isn't great? Wouldn't it be best to wait and see what you get this afternoon? So now you know what you're dealing with. Uh, again, you guys, I, I don't envy you guys. You got your license in a very unique market, very unique market. Um, multiple offers galore. Um, we're getting back to, <laughs> I hesitate to use the word normal, but we're getting back to a normal, normal market. Um, and we're still gonna see multiple offers, but we need to keep our seller informed of any possible offers that may be coming understanding that we don't have to wait for it, but just giving them all the information before they make this decision. As we've mentioned, any questions or concerns about your commission, bonuses, uh, anything like that, we need to work out before we write or present the offer. Uh, remember all of our commission bonuses, et cetera. Guys, that all belongs in our agency agreements. That's why we have those employment contracts. Offer to purchase and contract is between the buyer and the seller. And the big picture says you and I do not belong in the offer to purchase and contract. And we have zero authority to accept or reject an offer on behalf of our buyers or sellers. We only speak on their behalf. We don't act on their behalf. So what if? What if your seller is going to go out of the country for two weeks and they're not going to get the Wi-Fi package or they're not going to, you know, be accessible? Well, can they look at you and say, just accept anything that comes in close to this amount? I know you can work it out for me. Yeah, no. What does old car say? Old car says I follow my clients lawful instructions. So even though they give me that instruction to just accept anything that comes in on this amount, that's not a lawful instruction and I can't follow that. So what do we do? Well, maybe they have a family member here that they trust with leaving, making those decisions. That one makes me a little bit nervous. I don't know about you guys, but they, you know, we know what happens when it goes down with family, right? It might be if they're gonna be out of touch for two weeks, it might be our best option is to take it off the market for two weeks. If we can't get anybody to respond to an offer, um, that might be our best bet. Case by case scenario, I understand, but bottom line, we cannot accept that on their behalf. We only speak on their behalf. Again, we, we act as the, the delivery man. My seller tells me something, I relay it to the, to the buyer side. Then we we're in this crazy world of multiple offers. So remember what we've been saying, all offers need to be presented immediately. Well, a lot of times with multiple offers, you might see highest and best. It might say all offers are due by, I don't know, 5 p.m. on Friday. Um, should I wait until I get all offers and present them all at once to my seller? Well, let's go back to what it says. When do I deliver offers? immediately, but in no event later than three days. So what's today, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday? Oh, we're cutting it close, but I guess technically I could hang on to them, but what if the dream offer comes in today? Does the seller have to wait till 5 p.m. to accept it on Friday? Do they have to wait until the best and final? No, the seller is free to accept any offer at any time, even if we've called for best and final. 
So with multiple offers, we wanna deliver what we have in our hand immediately. Um, tell your sellers, we're like, look, we'll sit down and talk about all of them Friday at five, but I'm gonna send them as they come in so you can start looking them over. We need to present all offers that we have in our hand at the same time in no particular order. I cannot favor one offer over the other. So here we go, what if? What if one of the offers is from another agent in my firm? Wouldn't the firm stand to make both sides of the commission, buyer and seller? So isn't that the best offer to present to my seller and put the other ones off to the side? Nope. What if I'm representing the buyer and I stand to make both sides of the commission? Can I put that, can I favor that one? Can I say, look at this one first? Because it, but no, we present them all at the same time, no particular order. I know one thing that's coming out of this multiple offer world that we're just getting out of, one thing that happened that I liked a whole lot. In addition to presenting the offers, we still have a duty to send the offers to the sellers. But in addition to that, listing agents were doing like Excel spreadsheets and saying, here are the terms of offer number one, sales price, due diligence, earnest money, closing date, da, da, da. Offer number two, offer number three, offer number four. Understand I still have a duty to present the offers. But by putting them on an Excel sheet, we can do a nice side-by-side -side comparison because it's not just about the purchase price, is it? It's considering all of the terms, all of the negotiating points. So the Excel spreadsheet, again, it just allowed sellers to see the important things. Our offer to purchase and contract is 16 pages now. Do you think that can get a little intimidating to a seller? So if you have, I don't know, what's a good number? If you get 20 offers and they're 16 pages, what are you going to do? Send your seller 320 pieces of paper and say, look this over and let me know which one you want. The seller just went blank on you, didn't they? So help them interpret those 320 pages. Help them interpret those 20 offers so they can choose the one that's best for them. Listing agents, you have a duty to treat all buyers and buyer's agents the same. Remember what we owe our customers, honesty and fairness. So if you tell one buyer a favorable term, then you need to tell another buyer, all buyers, that favorable term. Um, there was a big thing in this multiple offer world. Buyer's agents were calling listing agents and saying, what would your seller's preferred price be? Or what, you know, what could get me in? Again, there's no rule that says that they can't ask. The rule says how we respond. Everybody with me? So if I tell one, this is my seller's favorable purchase price, isn't it fair and honest that I call all the buyers, buyer's agents and say, this is their favorable purchase price. So what you do for one, you do for all. So I wanna share this with you. You guys see this picture, this cute little house? This was a listing I took. I had to put the date down to remember because time gets away from me. This was a listing I took in May of 2017. So this was before this crazy multiple offer world. We were just getting introduced to this crazy multiple offer world. And it's a cute little house, is it not? Good location, everything about it is just adorable. What I thought the problem with it was, <laughs> it's a three bed, one bath. And my sellers had looked at installing a second bath because don't we want all in our own bathroom now? So the sellers at some point had looked at, but the cost just wasn't reasonable. They knew that they wouldn't get that back. So I'm not saying installing a second bathroom wasn't, but for my sellers, when they were considering that, it was not. And I told him, I said, that's the concern that I have. I said, you know, we'll find a buyer. There's always a buyer out there, but just heads up. We were on the market for about two and a half days. Uh, I had 17 showings. The neighbors were calling the sellers, talking about the circus that was going on outside. I had cars lined down the street, around the corner. We had people all over the place. Y'all, this was 2017. I was like, what in the world is going on? It wasn't like it was last year where there's just part of doing business. This was 2017. Um, my, all my showings, I think I ended up with six offers. And here's the problem. They were all really good. 
in a normal situation, there was nothing to counter. We had to, I mean, literally my sellers were like, we're gonna take that one. And that's pretty much what it came down to because they were all good. I was one of the first in the multiple offer. I remember sharing with my team what I'd been through, <laughs> you know. By the way, can you counter multiple offers at the same time? Yeah, I'm going to say no. Because what if you counter five and all five accept? Now your seller's in a bit of a pickle, aren't they? So if you need to counter, counter one at a time, you know, pick the one that's the closest, counter that one. If you can make it work, then you reject all the others, but just be careful you don't put your sellers in a situation because now you might be in court showing emails with date and time stamps about which one got in first. You, you guys know what I'm saying? So showing your phone records and everything, I don't want you guys to do that. So just counter one at a time. The fact that we have multiple offers is not a material fact. Multiple offers is not a material fact. It's up to the sellers whether or not we disclose we have multiple offers. Have a conversation with your sellers if you think you're going to get multiple offers. And it's their choice. Some buyers, when they find out they're in a possible multiple offer situation, are gonna turn around and run away. Other buyers, when they find out they're in a multiple offer situation, will up their game. So whether or not we chase them off or we try to get them to up their game, again, that's a conversation we need to have with the sellers and see what they're comfortable doing. Once again, you guys, agents can call and ask you if you have multiple offers. There's no law against that, no rule against that. We need to be careful how we respond. And if your seller doesn't want you to disclose, what's your honest answer? My seller doesn't choose to disclose that. That's pretty dang honest, isn't it? So just make sure, don't lie. Don't say no when you do. And the other thing that we need to know is that we cannot share the terms of the offer without the offer or's permission the offer or being the person giving the offer. As a buyer's agent, can I call the listing agent and say, what's the highest offer you have in your hand right now? Can I ask? Yeah, you need to be careful how you respond. We cannot share the terms. Y'all don't let people catch you off guard. That's what they're trying to do, you guys. They're trying to catch you off guard. You think, well, I didn't think a commission rule says I can't do that. Again, there's no rule that says they can't ask. The rule says how you respond. So we cannot share the terms of the offer without the offer or's permission. Do you think an offer or in their right mind is going to give you permission to disclose the terms of their offer with other offer or's? No, you're giving them a challenge at this point. What if you are a buyer's agent working with two buyers that are interested in the same property? Ah, oh, that just got fun, didn't it? Can you pit your buyers together? I know how much this one is offering. Can you beat it? This is how much due diligence this one's put. Don't pit your buyers together. Guys, remember what we talked about like day one or day two? All buyers have a different risk tolerance. So if you have different buyers with the same, interested in the same property, do the same CMA for them, provide the same information for them and let them decide what they're comfortable offering, due diligence, earnest money, da 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 Don't pit them together. What questions do I have on multiple offers? Well, you guys, we're going to look at just one more form tonight. Because this goes along with multiple offers and it checks off another form that we need to look at on our forms list. 
This is called response to buyer's offer. And this is pretty much a letter from the seller to the buyer. So the buyer's presented an offer. Now the seller's using this to respond. Um, again, an email will suffice, right? Any kind of response is fine, but this just gives us a nice official, neat little um, response. So it's to the buyer regarding the offer to purchase on 123 Main Street. And here's our offer date. And then you can see we have three choices and we're told to only check one. So three choices, one check per form. The first option is thank you for your offer. We cannot accept it as written and hereby reject it. However, while this is not a counter offer, we would favorably consider the following changes. And then this gives the seller the opportunity to put their cards on the table. What would they consider a favorable purchase price, earnest money, due diligence, closing date, et cetera, et cetera. I think where this form or with this piece of the form could be handy is if it's a low ball offer and nobody, you know, if the seller's up here and the buyer's down here, how many times do we have to counter to get that thing closed? So it could save everybody some time if the seller just said, look, this is, this is what I'll consider, you, you know, either do it or don't, but I'm going to reject the offer that you gave me. This does go on to say, if the above changes are acceptable to you, please submit another offer with the notice changes. Please understand that until an offer has been accepted, we are free to consider and may at any time accept any offer um, to purchase presented that contain terms and conditions satisfactory to us. So if you provide this, if the seller provides this with their cards on the table, do they have to wait for you to decide if you're going to bring another offer or not? No, because the seller is free to accept any offer they choose at any time. The second box here was added. Um, that was our last change in 2019. The second option was added as a result of the crazy multiple offer world that we were in. So this says, thank you for your offer. Please be advised that we intend to consider all offers received by we're going to put the date and time that we call for highest and best. Should you choose to submit another offer, we encourage you to submit your best offer as soon as possible and in no event later than the date and time set forth in the preceding sentence. If you neither submit another offer nor withdraw your current offer, we will consider your current offer along with all others. However, please understand that we may in our sole discretion choose to accept any offer, including yours, prior to the date and time set forth above, or we may choose not to accept any offer submitted by the date and time set forth above. The seller is free to accept any offer at any time. So really what the seller's notifying the buyer of is that we got your offer, but now we have others, we have multiple offers. So if you want an opportunity to up your game, this is it. The third is, <laughs> Just the politest no I've ever read in my entire life. Thank you for your offer to purchase. We cannot accept the offer as written and hereby reject it. Have a nice day. That's the only thing that's, meant, that's missing is have a nice day. Um, obviously you can reject on an email or a text, right? As long as you communicate. Again, when you if you ever work with a, have the opportunity to work with a seasoned agent, somebody who's been around 30, 40 years, for example, they were raised to use this form for a rejection. So you may know right away what you get just based on they were raised. This form has always been around, but it got new life breathed into it with this second option here. But really all this form is, is a rejection. Um, seller has the chance to sign it, choose one option. Response to buyer's offer, question on that one. So we are, um, I got two more minutes. Let me say one more thing. 
Real Estate Commission's website, ncrec.gov. Remember, we looked at a few tabs. There's a lot more here to explore than what we've looked at, but just to kind of piggyback on what we've said tonight, uh, my favorite place to go in here is publications, publications. You guys see that publications and then you click on publications again. And one thing that I find so useful are these Q&A brochures. Um, we briefly looked at one the other day. It was the offer and acceptance. But just so you guys know, there's a Q&A brochure on the real estate closing. So if you're walking maybe a first time home buyer through the transaction, this brochure helps put words in your mouth. Um, due diligence for residential buyers. You can use this to help your buyers um, and even sellers for that matter, better understand the due diligence. There's a Q&A on earnest money deposits. Here's one on fair housing, home inspections. We looked at offer and acceptance. So much good stuff here. So again, you guys, um, why are you trying to recreate the wheel? Let these forms, let the Q&A brochures put words in your mouth. Don't stand there and read that to them, but put it in their hand, have a conversation with them about it to help them understand. I still finish before 10.15. Any questions? All right. I have a question about prorating. Yeah. Um, so can you explain again, like on the closing disclosure, like when it's a, when it's the, you know, when you determine whether you debit or credit, like I understand that, okay, let's say that it closes after September, but it hasn't mm -hmm. been paid. So is mm -hmm. that, is the, that year paid at the closing or does the buyer have to pay that after, after everything's finished? So if closing, if it's unpaid, and closing is after September, what we're gonna do, what the attorney is gonna do is a double debit. So they're gonna charge the seller for their portion. They're gonna, I say charge, they're gonna do a debit to the seller for their portion. They're gonna do a debit to the buyer for their portion. So the attorney's collecting money from both parties. And then the attorney will send one check to you know Forsyth County or wherever the taxes are due. Okay. So if they're unpaid, whether or not we do a, let's see, the buyer will pay them. So whether or not we do a debit the seller, credit the buyer, or if it's going to be a double debit, it depends on when closing is. I see. So the only situation where, because I was looking at some of the problems and I noticed that uh, most of the time it's just on page two, where it's like a transfer, like a debit the seller, uh, credit the buyer. but then. I think the only situation where it's on page one and they're both debited is in that situation, or is there another situation where they're both debited? No, just after after September. Okay, yep. All right, thank you. Yep, HOA dues, you're not gonna have a double debit, right? It's gonna be a true proration, debit one party, credit the other. Okay. Yep, yep, September's that magic, that magic time, because now we know we've got the bill in the hands, now we know that, now we know that they're due. Okay, thank you. Okay, of course. Anything else? All right, guys, we'll do it again tomorrow. 515. Y'all have a good night. Good night. Good night.